Welcome everyone to day two of the statewide walnut series. I just wanted to go over some of the logistics before we get started. Um, again, Q and A, uh, that's where you'll put your questions for your speakers. Make sure to type the name of the speaker before your question so we make sure it gets posed to the right speaker and use chat for comments, discussion, Make sure to use the drop down to select all panelists and attendees so that everyone can see your message. Um, I think it's automatically set to all panelists, so make sure you change it to all panelists and attendees. Continuing education. Uh, today we have DPR, which um, we have three hours. It's all the presentations. If you want all three hours, you must be here present for all three hours. We do check that. so. Um, make sure you're logged in and paying attention. We will also have poll questions after each presentation. Make sure you um, pay attention to those poll questions because they will be uh, on a test that is emailed to you after the event. And you have to pass that test with 70% in order to receive your credits. The test will be emailed with you within 24 hours and you have approximately a week to take it, but I recommend taking it right away because if you do not pass, you get another chance, but you still only have a week to do it. So take it right away. Um, one important thing is only one user per device is eligible for credit. So if you're sitting somewhere and you have multiple people watching your screen, only one person can get credit based off of the user watching the screen. A way around that is for the other participants to call in you phone in and then you their phone participation gives them credit. So make sure if you have multiple people watching on the screen right now that you have to have a separate device to get credit. Um, certified crop advisor, same as yesterday, a QR code will go up and be displayed at the end of the meeting. You use the app to scan it and get your credit. If you do not have the app or you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can email me and I will add you to the list. That's, that's certified crop advisor. DPR will need an exam, both, both private applicators, PCAs, all of them, you'll have to take an exam. I think that's it for me. I'm going to turn it over to Carrie. Thank you very much, Kelly. Uh, and thank you everyone for attending today. Yes, we are on day two. This is where you're getting your DPR credits. Kelly discussed all that. Uh, we wanna give a big warm thank you to the California Walnut Board for sponsoring this meeting. There are costs associated, even though it's a virtual meeting. And uh, we want to make sure that we can we can offer all this information to you, you know, with or without pandemics going on in in the um, in the nation. So big thank you to California Walnut Board. Big thank you to Kelly McFarland and the Agriculture and Natural Resources Program Support Unit through the University of California. They did all the background work. They are the ones who you got emails from and links and everything else. And also they handled all the credits, CCA, EPR, etc. So big big thank you to them. She's doing a fantastic job. I want to thank the speakers for uh, coming today and providing your information. People are really excited to hear what's going on. And I want to take one quick minute to uh, share my screen and introduce Douglas Amaral. So he is new to Kings and Tulare County. He is covering uh, orchards. He's covering pomology and water and soils. So that's his specialty. He's covering Kings and Tulare County. He started a few months ago, maybe a little longer than that. Uh, he worked with me as a postdoc on, on a cherry project, and we're gonna continue doing that as well. So he's tough as nails. He likes to cut up trees, so watch out. Just kidding. He's going, he will take good care of you. If you're in that area, give him a call, send him an email, let him know who you are and what you do, because uh, he's really excited and ready to meet people. And, uh, and help out. So this is his contact information. Hopefully you can see it. We have uh, 680 Campus Drive, Suite A, Hanford, California. Phone number is 559-852-2737. And his email is just below there. Also, you can just Google search Douglas Amaral UCCE and you'll find a bunch of good information on him. All right. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mohammed Nouri. Dr. Mohammed Nouri, he is new He's relatively new. He's he's been around for two years. Maybe still new. 
Yeah, it's still new. That's okay. Almost we're two years, I think. We're new for at least three years. That's what I'm told. Um, he is in San Joaquin County. He covers orchard systems, uh, in particular walnuts, olives, apples, and um, cherries. So I'm going to hand it over to him, and he is going to take us through the day. Go for it, Mark. Great. Thank you so much, Kerry. Uh, I think we are good to start. I would also like to thank so much everyone who helped organize this Walnut Statewide event. A special thanks to you, Kerry, and Kerry McFarland for all your efforts. With that, we will start with our first speaker, Roger Baldwin. Roger is a Cooperative Extension Specialist at the University of California, Davis. Roger's research interest focuses broadly on, in the field of wildlife management with a special focus on resolving human wildlife conflicts. So Roger, we look forward to hearing from you and finding out what new information you have on uh, managing rodent pests in one month. That's great, thanks. <clears throat> Get my screen up here. Always take a second. Perfect. Okay, can everybody see that by now? Yes, perfect. Okay, we're good to go, all right. So, um, yeah, I am going to be talking about managing rodent pests uh, today with a sp uh, particular emphasis on what's news. So, uh, providing some updates on some of the research that I've been involved with over the last few years, as well as some new tools and, and new materials that are available, and maybe even a little bit uh, of, of chatter about um, some new legislative actions that may, may impact us all. Um, but I did think we'd at least start off by... Uh, uh, providing a little bit of information uh, about the species that I'm going to be covering today. I am going to be focusing specifically on burrowing rodents. And of course, when we talk about burrowing rodents, one of the first ones we always think about is California ground squirrel. Uh, ground squirrels uh, are found throughout most of the state, uh, certainly cause a wide uh, variety of, of forms of damage in, in orchard systems, including direct consumption of nuts. Uh, the burrowing activities causing problems, chewing on irrigation lines, etc. Uh, we also have pocket gophers. Pocket gophers are pretty ubiquitous throughout the state. Uh, there probably isn't hardly a walnut orchard out there that doesn't have at least one or two gopher mounds uh, running, uh, uh, popping up occasionally out there. Uh, so they can cause problems in, in a wide variety of settings. Voles are also out there. Sometimes people call voles metal mice, so maybe you're more familiar with that term. Voles are not as common, um, but when they're found, they can be quite damaging, particularly in orchards, in, in newly planted orchards. Uh, they do quite extensive girdling damage to, to new trees. Once the trees become relatively mature, that we no longer see too many problems with voles usually. Roof rats are also present in certain areas. Uh, they're definitely not found throughout the state, uh, not in all orchards, but where they, can't, where they are found, they can, can be problematic. And I'll talk just very briefly about deer mice today. Deer mice are found throughout the state as well, usually not causing too many problems in, in particularly in walnut orchards, but they are out there and they can occasionally cause uh, some problems. And we'll talk just very briefly about uh, one of the tools we use to manage deer mice. One of the pro uh, projects that I have, or that I was involved with here a few years ago, looked at the potential impact that uh, adjacent um, hedgerow habitat might have on uh, not just walnut orchards, but, but uh, uh, different types of cropping systems. I worked on this with Rachel Long, who's done a lot of work with hedgerows over the last decade or so. And, you know, having these kinds of hedgerows uh, adjacent to fields can provide some potential benefits, including um, increasing uh, populations of beneficial insects, uh, perhaps increasing populations of birds that might predate on damaging insects, uh, providing general wildlife habitat, etc. Well, one of the concerns about having these kinds of uh, uh, this type of habitat out there is that it might potentially increase problems associated with rodents and rodent incursion into uh, these crop areas, which could lead to a potentially um, uh, increased damage to, to the crops as well as perhaps pose a potential food safety risk uh, by having these animals out there. 
So we set up a study and, and looked at this. Uh, this data that I'm providing here is specific to, to walnuts here today. Um, but in, in this was a much larger study. I'm just gonna pro be providing a very broad overview of, of what we found. But in short, what we found is that having um, this kind of hedgerow habitat adjacent to walnut orchards did not lead to greater wildlife incursion into fields. Certainly we did have a greater abundance of rodents directly in the hedgerow, but once we got even just 10 meters away from the hedgerow, we were not seeing any kind of significant difference in rodent populations there, as opposed to uh, what we considered our control side, which was the um, conventionally managed field edge, is basically you know farming up to the road more or less, not not any real habitat out there. And as we expanded out into the orchards, uh, we saw the same general pattern. In other words, having these kinds of hedgerows did not increase wildlife incursion out in, into the orchards. And so that was good news. And like I said, we also looked at foodborne pathogens, in particular E. coli 0157, Salmonella, Giardia, and Cryptosporidia. Um, we looked at whether or not having hedgerow habitats uh, increased the prevalence of these kinds of foodborne pathogens, and it did not. Uh, so that also was good news. So in short, having these kinds of hedgerow habitats adjacent to, to these fields did not um, lead to any increased problems associated with rodents. And so that was good news. They certainly can provide some, some benefits and, and we didn't see any problems there associated with that. That said, there are different kinds of field edge habitats, right? And so this would be what we would consider a more conventionally managed field edge habitat, obviously an irrigation canal coming, but there's no real kind of abundant hedgerow or, or habitat associated with that. Conversely, just across the, the road from this exact same site, there's this kind of habitat here, right? We could consider this a hedgerow habitat, a riparian habitat, however you want to define it. The point being is this is pretty substantial um, habitat here. Um, certainly more so than what we were looking at in our study. Uh, so if we have really thick, abundant, wide areas of habitat, it might be possible that having that adjacent to fields could lead to, to greater wildlife uh, incursion and, and problems associated with that, but we don't know. Uh, we haven't looked at anything um, this expansive yet, but certainly for, for what a lot of people are planning for, for field edge habitat, we didn't really see any increased problems uh, associated with that. So we've looked at a variety of different tools to try to, to mitigate uh, movement of critters into uh, these fields. One of the things we've looked at was fencing, uh, in particular for gophers. Uh, it's been you know, talked about for, for years, maybe we can put some, some wire mesh buried below ground and, and keep the gophers from being able to, to dig into fields. And so we did look at this, we dug trenches about two and a half feet deep and we put gopher wire all the way down uh, the entire length of that and, and allowed it to extend above ground uh, to see if we could slow down uh, gopher incursion into those areas. Of course, right from the very beginning, uh, we suspected it probably wasn't going to work. As you see, we've got a nice little gopher tunnel system already two and a half feet deep. So that gives a pretty good indication that they're probably gonna find a way around this kind of fencing. And of course they did. Uh, so, you know, gopher fencing, probably not a very practical approach. Um, so, you know, not, not all of these things are successes, um, but we have also looked at fencing for voles and we definitely had better success with fencing for voles. Uh, in particular, what we tested was aluminum flashing. Uh, we took a sheet of aluminum flashing, we buried it about six inches below ground and allowed it to extend eight to 12 inches above ground. And this did substantially slow down movement of voles from natural areas, such as we see in the top photo here, into artichoke fields. Um, the way artichokes are, are grown, they're perennial, um, they grow throughout most of the year, but then March, April, they go through and they mow down all the vegetation. Uh, the fields become completely denuded. There's nothing out there. And so the voles leave. When the voles leave, they go into these natural areas. And the idea was trying to keep them from moving from these natural areas back into the artichoke fields once they started growing up. And so we used this kind of aluminum flashing and we did find out that it did slow down that reinvasion. It doesn't completely stop it, of course, but it does slow it down. And so if you have adjacent habitats where you constantly have vole movements from and into an orchard, 
then I think something like this might potentially be a good strategy. Um, you know, you're not probably going to be able to fence off an entire field. That's not practical. You need to be able to move equipment in and out of fields, things along those lines. So it's not, it's not going to be an ideal tool in all situations. In fact, it's probably not going to be a tool that's going to be overly practical in most situations. But if you do have those kinds of adjacent habitats where you constantly have wool movement out of and into orchards, then I think those are the kinds of areas where you could consider uh, putting this kind of fencing in. The last thing I'll leave you with on this is that if you do utilize a, a fencing approach, I do strongly recommend that you keep um, all vegetation removed from around the base of that fencing, preferably for one to two feet uh, away from that fence. If you have vegetation growing right next to the fence, then the voles can linger in that area and they can probably figure out ways to dig down and around those kinds of structures. But voles are very cover dependent. And so if you don't have cover uh, immediately adjacent to that structure, it's probably not going to spend much time there because then they're pretty susceptible to, to predation. So do keep that in mind. We also have more traditional ways of thinking about exclusion, uh, particularly with voles that's usually in the form of tree protectors. And you can put these tree protectors around the base of newly planted trees and they can be fairly effective if used properly. Uh, to reduce that growing damage. But you can imagine that's fairly time consuming and, and, um, and costly to utilize that. So what if there was another strategy that we could use that would be equally effective, uh, but maybe a little bit less labor intensive and costly? And one way we might be able to do that is to utilize repellents. Now with repellents, we're usually thinking of chemical type repellents that create objectionable odors, unpleasant tastes, um, some kind of fear response, something along those lines. And there's lots of different kinds of repellents that are out there. Uh, they generally have not worked well for rodents. Um, rodents are, live in a landscape of fear. They're constantly in fear for their life. Um, they're constantly searching for new food resources, things along those lines. So just because something doesn't taste good or because you might throw a predator urine out there, you know, these are things that, that rodents have to live with on a daily basis. But there's another kind of rep uh, repellent out there as well, and these are post-ingestive repellents. Anthroquinone is an example of a post-ingestive repellent. It was first developed for, for birds and is registered uh, for bird use in some states, although not in California. And the way this product works is that the animal actually has to consume a little bit of it one time. When it consumes a little bit of it, a little bit of it, it causes them to get sick, and then they learn to avoid feeding on it uh, in future. Uh, situations. We looked at it with uh, several different uh, mammalian species, mostly rodents, but as well, uh, but rabbits as well. And we found that it actually uh, was a pretty effective repellent against most of them. In particular, with voles in, in our lab trials, we had 84% repellency with the highest concentration of anthroquinone. So we thought, well, this is pretty good. Is this something that we could maybe utilize in a field setting? And when we started to think about it, we thought that um, tree crops might be actually the best uh, scenario for which this might work. Voles, unlike a lot of rodent species, really do not climb very well. So we thought that if we coated the bottom uh, 10 to 12 inches of a tree, which is the area that voles girdle, such as what we can see right here, then that might be a way to reduce that kind of girdling damage. And so we set up a trial. Uh, where we uh, had a lot of trees, some treated, not treated, and we looked at the amount of girdling damage. We looked at it a couple different seasons. We did the cool, wet season or springtime, and then hot, dry in summer. And what we found out is that the anthroponone, uh, in fact, was very effective at reducing girdling damage. We had uh, anywhere from a, a 10 to 20 fold reduction in girdling damage uh, for trees that were treated with anthroquinone. So it did seem to be very effective at reducing that girdling damage. We also wanted to assess the longevity of this product. A lot of time with repellents, um, you have to keep reapplying them uh, to, to maintain the efficacy associated with them. And of course, that's a lot of labor and a lot of cost associated with that. So we wanted to see how long it would uh, last and that's what this chart's uh, illustrating here. Long story short, um, we did not see an increase in girdling damage over time. We looked up to, to five weeks here in summer. We looked up to six weeks in the springtime. Had no inclination whatsoever that, that uh, girdling damage was going to increase. 
Uh, some other trials with other scenarios have shown repellency for one to two years or more uh, for bird species. And so we think there's probably uh, a real extended um, uh, a period of efficacy associated with this. Uh, we, we're still not really sure how long it's going to last for, for voles. My guess is maybe up to a year or so. Keep in mind with, with trees, you're going to have new growth as the tree grows, that part's going to be unprotected. So there will have to be some reapplication periodically. Um, but my guess is once every year or two might be all you need to do. Uh, so I do think this is uh, potentially a really good option moving forward for folks who have extensive problems with bowl girdling damage. It is not currently registered though for use. Um, but they are going through the registration process. So the hope is that within one to two years that this will be uh, an option that we can have. Now, we're also starting to see a proliferation of uh, subsurface drip irrigation or SDI throughout the state for a wide variety of different crops. Uh, one of the biggest hurdles for greater implementation of SDI is, is gopher damage to the drip tape. Uh, the depth of the drip tape is usually at the perfect level for gophers, and so they come through and they chew quite extensively on this drip tape. It creates all these kinds of situations here where you have substantial flooding, which leads to, to all kinds of issues. So if we're going to see greater utilization of STI, which is a really good irrigation tool, then we're going to have to solve this gopher issue. And one of the potential um, options that we've looked at is, is trying to force a repellent through the water during the irrigation event. Can that perhaps repel gophers, move them out of, out of a particular area? So there's a product called Protect-T. It's uh, uh, registered and sold by Agwater Chemical out of Fresno. Uh, this just became um, registered for use in California as of January of this year. So it is a product that is now available for use. Um, like I said, it's, it's forced through the water uh, through an irrigation event. And uh, we just begun to look at the efficacy of this. What we have seen so far is about a 41% reduction in fields treated with this. So, um, you know, it's not getting rid of the gophers for you, but it is reducing the number of gophers out there. And so I think there's some potential benefit. We need to look at it a little bit more extensively yet. So the the final story isn't in on this one yet, but, but early results, I think, are, are relatively promising. In particular, what we need to find out is if it reduces the uh, number of strikes in this drip tape. That's really the most important um, uh, thing that we need to, to measure, and we haven't had a chance to do that yet. So I, I'm really not sure, uh, but I would assume it is reducing um, the amount of damage if we're already seeing a reduction in the number of gophers in a particular area. So stay tuned on that one, but I think it's, it's potentially promising there. But ground squirrels are another species that causes a lot of problems in orchard systems. Um, anticoagulant rodenticides are really one of the primary tools that we've used to manage ground squirrels in, in orchard systems. These anticoagulants are usually applied in one of three methods. There's this uh, spot treatments where you take a designated amount of bait and spread it very thinly around the burrow opening. Uh, that's usually used only if you have a few burrow systems to treat. We also use broadcast applications, which is where we use a calibrated seed spreader to spread bait um, over a broad area uh, far more rapidly. So that's used uh, a fair amount as well. And then in orchard systems, we primarily use bait stations, which house bait and allows the ground squirrels to come into that bait station and feed directly on it. Um, all of these can be uh, effective strategies for reducing ground squirrel populations in a given area. However, there is uh, increased scrutiny on the use of anticoagulants these days. Uh, for example, um, they all became uh, federally, federally restricted use products here uh, a number of years ago. Uh, this was due to um, potential concerns about secondary toxicity. Secondary toxicity is when um, predators and scavengers might feed on in, uh, intoxicated or poisoned rodents and potentially get uh, a lethal dose themselves. Um, this also led to a number of assembly bills that have been introduced uh, in California over the last several years, looking to ban the use of rodenticides and a lot of particular um, anticoagulant rodenticides in a lot of different scenarios. And this last year, Assembly Bill 1788 was um, actually successful. It was signed by the governor 
and has uh, restricted the use, particularly of second generation anticoagulants, which those are the rat and mouse poisons that have historically been used a lot uh, in a lot of areas throughout the state. There are some exemptions for ag use and a few other exemptions, but, but for uh, the greatest extent, um, their use has, has been substantially curtailed. Um, this hasn't trickled down to the first generation anticoagulants, difastone and chlorofastone, which we use for field rodents, but there's increased pressure on those as well. So we wanted to kind of gather some more information about the potential risk associated with the use of these particular products, as well as trying to explore some options for reducing that potential risk. So we set up a study to kind of look at uh, some of those different factors, particularly as it pertain to California ground squirrels. So in particular, the objectives of this study were number one, to, re, uh, to determine residual concentrations of difasnone via the three application strategies. The reason why is that a predecessor of mine did some, some initial work that suggested that um, broadcast applications and spot treatments might result in lower residual concentrations than bait stations. The reason being with a bait station, you have a constant bait supply, so the squirrels can keep feeding on it for several days before they get a lethal dose. So maybe that would lead to higher residual concentrations. So we were curious if that was in fact the case. We also wanted to determine if time to death varied for the differing application strategies. Here, the, the, the thought process being if if the time from consumption to mortality is shorter, then that lessens the um, secondary exposure risk uh, because th there's less time that they're available out there after initially consuming these products. And third, we wanted to determine what proportion died below ground. Um, for years, we've heard that most of the ground squirrels die below ground, but it's never actually really been tested before. And we wanted to, to determine what proportion that was because if most of them are dying below ground, then that also reduces uh, the secondary exposure risk. So quickly, what we found, number one, time from application to death did not vary across the three different application strategies. So it didn't really matter from that perspective what we used. Uh, the average mortality was between eight and nine days after initial application. As far as where the ground squirrels died, um, the vast majority of them died below ground. I'm not gonna get too much in the weeds here, but basically, for those ground squirrels where we could verify where they died, we know um, for those 91% of them died within the burrow systems or a very high proportion of them. There were a few cases where we thought they might have been scavenged, but we couldn't verify that. If we included them in our assessment, we still had 84% dying below ground. So again, the vast majority of these ground squirrels were dying below ground, and that did not matter whether or not we were looking at it during uh, summer or autumn seasons. Uh, so that's good news. They're, most of them were not available for scavenging. But as far as the residual um, concentrations of difasone, um, this was a, perhaps a little bit surprising to us uh, we did not see any difference in residual concentrations across the three different application strategies. We did, of course, see a difference between those application strategies for those ground squirrels that, that died from the consumption versus those that survived, and of course the control squirrels, which we didn't provide any toxicant to, so we would expect that to be quite low. Um, so number one, it didn't matter if we used bait stations or some other tool, we saw the same residual concentration there. But also for those ground squirrels that were in the bait application areas that survived, um, they had much lower residual concentration. So that's good. By having lower residual con uh, concentrations, that means that they pose much lower risk for non-target species. So what's the take home message here? Number one, we can utilize whatever application strategy we want because number one, time to death doesn't differ and because residual concentrations do not differ. Number two, um, most of the ground squirrels are dying below ground. So that reduces secondary exposure risk there. And for those ground squirrels that do survive, they have much lower um, uh, uh, residual concentrations than the animal as well. Uh, so I think we learned quite a bit about um, that process through this study. Um, we also will use uh, rodenticide applications to manage uh, roof rats and deer mice in orchard systems. Uh, this was a study, this, this is a little bit older uh, information here. This study was uh, from about 10 years ago, but I think it's still really 
uh, germane to this particular audience, but we looked at um, utilizing elevated bait stations with a 0.005% difasinone product. Uh, in, in this case, it was in almond orchards. And we found that this product uh, in this bait station was very effective at reducing both roof rat and deer mice populations. So if you have problems with deer mice or roof rats, um, this can be a good strategy to use. So keep that in mind. Um, if you want more information on this, we do have an extension publication uh, that was put together for managing roof rats and deer mice in, in orchards. So certainly I would encourage you to check that out if this is a, a situation that you're experiencing. Um, as of a few years ago, we now also have the legalization of carbon monoxide producing machines here in the state uh, or pressurized exhaust machines they're sometimes referred to as. There's four commercial products that I'm aware of. There's the PERC machine, which has been around the longest and is the one that we've done the most testing on. Uh, there's the cheetah rodent control machine, uh, the Burrow RX and the CO Jack, uh, but these are all devices that are designed to inject uh, pressurized exhaust or carbon monoxide into burrow systems. We've done some testing on them. Uh, they work pretty well. Uh, for gophers, we've seen about 60 to 65 percent efficacy overall, so relatively good. It's not as good as some other tools out there, but it's still relatively effective. And if we're talking about something like the PERC machine, if we go back to the previous slide, you see that there's multiple hoses and probes that come off of these devices. That means you can treat multiple burrow systems at once. So you can move through areas more rapidly with utilizing a device like this, as opposed to um, hand baiting or applying aluminum phosphide as a burrow fumigant or trapping or something along those lines. For ground squirrels, we had even better results in ideal moist conditions. We had 100% efficacy. And even in hot, dry soil conditions, when burrow fumigants generally do not work well, we still had 66% efficacy. This is much better than we would typically see with some of the other more traditional burrow fumigants like gas cartridges or aluminum phosphide in those dry conditions. So I do think that um, utilizing you know, these kinds of pressurized exhaust machines uh, are probably very effective for ground squirrels and relatively effective for gophers. Uh, we did look at the cheetah rodent control machine, which was this uh, modified leaf blower for ground squirrel control. We actually had more ground squirrels after treatment than before treatment, so not overly effective. Uh, uh, that, that particular device was not overly effective. The others we haven't tested yet, but they seem more similar to the PERC machine in design, so my guess is they'll perform more similar to those. Um, very quickly, we also have a carbon dioxide injection device that's now available as of, I think, about July or so of last year works in the same way. The difference is, is that you have to cart a tank of carbon dioxide around to inject it into the burrow system, as opposed to these other devices which create exhaust. So you're just utilizing the exhaust. Um, so maybe uh, some benefits there, but there's potentially some benefits to using the carbon dioxide as well. Uh, we haven't done extensive testing with this yet, but based on the results I have seen and the design, my guess is that it's going to work fairly similar to the um, pressurized exhaust devices. And then we also um, sometimes hear about dry ice being used, um, but it's not registered for use in ag fields. It's only for rats in urban areas. So that's not a legal application. Uh, very quickly, uh, I wanted to talk about um, a new kind of trap that's available. It's called the A24, which is manufactured by Good Nature out of New Zealand. It's an automatic resetting trap that has an automatic lure pump. You put it up in the trees, you attach it to a tree, a rat comes along, it smells the bait, it hits the trigger, it activates a CO2 fired bolt, which is then crushes the, the skull of the animal, kills it almost instantly. The animal drops down and the trap resets itself. So it's an automatic resetting trap that will reset up to 24 times and the lure will last for several months out there. So there's potentially some real benefit because you can put them out there and forget about them for a period of time. So labor is dramatically reduced with these kinds of devices, but they are very expensive, 150 to $200 a piece. And we're still not really sure how efficacious they are. So I have a project that's gonna get started here in the next week or two that's gonna look at that. Uh, so hopefully in a few years, we'll have more information on that. Um, very quickly, I'm, I'm kind of running short on time, so I'll just quickly mention that with shooting, it's a tool that can be used for ground squirrel control, but keep in mind, lead bullets are now banned in the state of California, and that um, limits, to some extent, the, the caliber of bullets that can be used. 
Uh, so keep that in mind. And then lastly, for those individuals who have problems with ground squirrels, I'll just quickly mention we have a ground squirrel best management practices website that contains all the information you're ever going to want to need or want to know or need uh, uh, when, when it comes to managing ground squirrels. So I encourage you to check that out. And with that, I think we're going to jump into a couple of our poll questions here real quick. Uh, so if we're ready to pop up those poll questions. Thank you, Roger. Thank you so much. So please, yeah, fill the poll questions so you can get your DPR credit. So I'll just quickly read them for you guys. Uh, the first one, uh, the question is true or false, anthoquinone is an effective repellent for preventing bowl girdling damage to new trees. And then secondly, following applications of difasinone treated grain, most ground squirrels die above ground. So true or false on both of those. We'll give you a little bit of time to answer them and then I think we'll cover the answers afterwards. We have around one minute to answer. All right, hey, success it looks like. Uh, so the first one, yeah, anthoquinone uh, was an, uh, uh, an effective repellent for preventing mole girdling damage, so that answer was true. And secondly, uh, most ground squirrels die below ground, not above ground, so the correct answer was false. So good job, everybody. Good job also for you, Roger. Thank you so much. It was Thanks, a great bet. presentation, and we have a few questions here. Yep. I have like maybe three minutes. So uh, question from John. Uh, what about moles? They do like damaged like gophers. So any solution for moles? So moles, um, the damage that moles cause is primarily just their mounding activities. Um, since they're, uh, they're insectivores, they eat worms and grubs and things like that. They don't actually eat plant material. So direct damage to the trees is, is really not generally present with moles, but the mounds do cause the same issues that gopher mounds do. And so if you're, if you're having problems there, then certainly um, that can, can be a problem. Uh, when it comes to moles, um, there are certain toxicants, or the, or the techni technically wouldn't be rodenticides since they're not rodents, but, but certain um, uh, toxicants that can be used. There are worm type baits that contain bromethylin, uh, which is a product that can be placed into mole burrow systems, which can be um, relatively effective. Uh, I say that because people tell me they're relatively effective. I actually have never seen a peer-reviewed study done on them, um, so I can't speak from, from that perspective. But I suspect they're relatively effective, but they are kind of pricey uh, compared to a lot of the other toxicants out there. So uh, that's a potential hurdle there. Uh, the, the other primary tool that's used is trapping. There's a variety of different kinds of mole traps out there uh, that can be used. Um, one that I like, it's, it's uh, the, the gopher version is called the gophinator. And then there's a smaller version that's designed specifically for moles. I forget what they call it, if it's just a mole trap or what. Um, but uh, those are available and, and are pretty good. Um, there's the uh, scissors type jaw trap, such as the uh, Victor out of sight trap, which is another type of trap that's um, uh, people generally think is, is a pretty effective tool. Otherwise, you know, you can try burrow fumigants, but the fumigants don't tend to work as well for moles because their burrow systems are shallower and they don't always hold the toxic gases in quite as well. Uh, so usually, usually it's trapping or maybe the, um, uh, the mole baits that are used. Okay, quick other question from Bob Bobidi. Do the tree protectors have to be buried into the soil slightly to prevent voles from getting underneath them? Yes, if you're going to use tree protectors, they should be pushed into the soil or buried uh, underground to some extent. I would prefer to see four to six inches um, below ground, um, but certainly at least a few inches, because if you just lay them on top of the ground, then the voles can just climb right up inside, and then you, you've got kind of the perfect environment for voles, because uh, they have cover. From the tree protector right so they won't be um, open to predation and they have food in the form of, of the tree uh, to feed on so um, there are stories of, of increased girdling damage out there from using tree protectors incorrectly than if they hadn't been used at all so yes if you're going to use them you do need to make sure that they're they're buried below ground so that's a good question okay very last quick question we have uh, several other questions please roger you can type the answers in the q a section but very quick question uh, is difasinone uh, toxic to dogs if they eat them? Yes. So um, 
pretty much all of the rodenticides that, that might be used could be toxic to, to pets, including dogs, and difacinone is the same, same way. The good thing about difacinone, though, is that, um, well, in the anticoagulants in, in particular have an antidote, and that's vitamin K. So if you know that a dog got into difacinone or if, if it ate intoxicated ground squirrels or something along those lines, you can take it to the vet and they can administer um, vitamin K. Uh, to counteract the difacinone, as opposed to some of the other rodenticides that are out there, such as zinc phosphide, strychnine, bromethylene, all of those other toxicants, none of them have a true antidote, um, which is one of the reasons why we like to use the anticoagulants, because they're safer from that perspective. They have an antidote that we can use to apply. But yes, they are toxic to dogs, and so you have to be careful before you use them. Perfect. Perfect. Thank you, Roger. So you please Type any answer if you can to uh, for other uh, questions that we don't have time to answer them. But we'll move to our next presenter. Uh -huh. so actually, we uh, we have two presenters for this topic. Elizabeth Fishner. Elizabeth is a farm advisor in Tulare County. In her position, she is covering pistachio, almond, walnut, pecan, prune, and olive in Tulare County, and also extends service to Kings County walnut grower. Uh, also, our second presenter in this topic, uh, Greg Brown. Greg is a USDA research plant pathologist. His research program examines the biology and integrated management of soil borne disease that affect deciduous tree crops. So Elizabeth and Greg, we are looking forward to your presentation and get update on walnut root stocks and disease. Okay, I hope, um, hope everyone can hear me. Yes, we hear you. Wondering if I need to. Is there a way you can minimize the um, pictures of people? Yes. Yes, there's, so if you're looking at the pictures of people, there should be some toggles across the top. The one that looks like just a line if you click that one, that should minimize it. Line. There's there's like a square. There's two lines together. There's a. It should. It's, oh, there it is. I see it now. Thank you. Sorry. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so again, I'm Elizabeth Fitchner, and I'm going to be talking about walnut root stocks. And I'll do the first half of the presentation, and then I will turn it over to Greg Brown. Oh, my forward's not working. Any idea why forward wouldn't work when, oh, here it goes, okay. So when you're looking at a walnut orchard, um, you have to first be aware of the fact that you're always looking at two different genotypes. You have the rootstock on the bottom of the tree and the scion or the cultivar that um, is giving rise to your commercial walnut crop. So uh, what is a rootstock? It is um, the trunk or the roots into which the scion material is inserted. And of course, the juncture of the rootstock and the scion is called the graft union. Why would you select um, a rootstock? Well, there's three main reasons um, we, that we would select for rootstocks for use in walnut orchards. One is for disease or pest tolerance. The second is for horticultural properties. It would be things like vigor, um, yield. Um, and the third would be adaptation to soil and water quality. These would be issues kind of like salinity, for example. In the early 1900s, Northern California black was the common rootstock of choice in California. And Northern California Black, that's Juglans heinzii, was chosen as a rootstock because it was considered resistant to oak root fungus, that's armillaria. Uh, it was considered tolerant of saline conditions, and it was considered less susceptible to crown gall. Luther Burbank had heard that there was a possibility to make um, interspecies crosses in um, Juglans species. 
So he gave this a try and he was the one that first uh, made the cross that gave rise to paradox. So this is his home in um, Santa Rosa and on the left is a hundred year old paradox tree and on the right, 25 year old paradox. So paradox gained popularity in the 1950s because it was more vigorous than the black walnut rootstock. It was tolerant to root lesion nematode and more resistant to Phytophthora. And over time, Paradox became the rootstock of choice. In this photo on the left, you can see the Paradox rootstock in an orchard and on the right, the Northern California black. So what is Paradox? It was, it was called Paradox because it's a paradox. Um, it was paradoxical because this was a fast growing hardwood. And it's an interspecies hybrid between Northern California black, Juglans heinzii, which is the female parent, crossed with the male parent being English walnut, Juglans regia. The Northern California black uh, is native to this Bay Area in California. And English walnut, um, its center of diversity is the Eastern Anatolia Peninsula into Western China. And that um, Anatolian Peninsula is also actually where olives are native to. Um, early on in the 1960s, there was the first walnut rootstock research trials. One was planted at the West Side Field Station on Pinochi Clay Loam, and one was planted at Kearney Ag Center on Hanford Sandy Loam. So we had these two distinct sites. And what they found was that at the Kearney Field Station on the Hanford Sandy Loam, Loam, the Paradox was an outstanding performer and it had a very high yield per tree. And then conversely, at the West Side Field Station on a Pinochi Clay Loam, the Paradox performed poorly and had smaller trees, lower yield and higher chloride accumulation than Northern California Black. This photo was given to me by Chuck Leslie, and you can see the black walnut was doing much better in these um, saline soils than Paradox, which is the, on the far end of the photo, or English in the middle. So in some situations, this black walnut rootstock was superior to Paradox. So Northern California black um, crosses with um, Juglans regia, produce seeds on the mother tree, those seeds are, the, are what gives rise, gives rise to paradox seedling rootstock, okay? And the interesting thing is when you have a seedling population from this interspecies cross, you do not have a uniform um, seed population. There is diversity just like any seedling population. So that is what gives rise to paradox seedling rootstock. So when you look at a paradox seedling rootstock nursery, you see a heterogeneity within the stand. Not all trees are identical. And that's because these are seedlings and they're genetically diverse. So then the next question you hear from growers are, well, where do these clones come from? And a lot of, a lot of um, growers that I've talked to sort of don't um, always understand that the clones are actually paradox. Um, they're not, um, the word paradox doesn't necessarily mean um, just seedling. It's also the, some of the clones are paradox. So the, and actually all of the clones in uh, walnut uh, used, to, used as commercial walnut rootstocks are paradox here in California. So what they did is they took the seedling paradox um, population and they selected phenotypes that had potential. They had characteristics that they liked. Then these select phenotypes were vegetatively propagated, so put into culture. And they were screened for, for properties, whether it was um, resistance to disease or um, horticultural properties. And then they were produced commercially. So these clones are grown in tissue culture and then they're reared out in greenhouses and you end up with this homogeneous stand because the clones are identical to each other. 
So how, how do they make these clones? Well, they're all through micropropagation. And that is the practice of rapidly multiplying stock plant material to produce a large number of progeny plants using tissue culture. So one of the benefits of clones over um, seedlings is that you can grow a lot of plants very quickly. So it just allows for rapid propagation. They use a proliferation of axillary buds. And the reason they use actually already formed buds is that um, there's a lower mutation risk than using an adventitious bud system. So you can get approximately five time proliferation of these rootstocks per month. And doing more apparently would cause um, higher risk of epigenetic variation. So what are these um, axillary buds? They're actually the buds that are in, in the nodes along a stem. So these buds are already formed and they're just excised and put into tissue culture. But one thing that's a little bit confusing is that micropropagation is a form of vegetative um, propagation. So you have a clonal, clonal population. When we use the term clone in walnut, we're referring to these um, micropropagated plants. When we talk about clones in pistachio, we're also talking about micropropagated plants. Then it gets a little confusing because when we look at the almond system, we have the micropropagated clones, but there are rootstocks that are also propagated from cuttings, vegetative cuttings. They are technically also clones. And so I just wanted to let you guys know that you know, the terminology can be a little bit confusing depending on what cropping system you're working with. So in the walnut system, when we talk about clones, we are talking about those micropropagated plants that are produced in tissue culture. So not all of the paradox rootstock have the same parentage. Within the commercially available um, paradox rootstocks, we have VX211 and Vlach, which are the result of a cross between Juglans heinzii and Juglans regia. So Northern California black and English walnut. So VX211 and Vlach are selections from that seedling population. Rx1, which many of you have heard about, is slightly different. It's still a paradox. However, the female parent is Juglans microcarpa. That's known as little walnut or Texas walnut. Um, there's several names for it. I got this photo from John Priest, the Juglans microcarpa. It's a small tree and it's in um, the uh, USDA germplasm collection in winters. And I'm gonna speak a little bit more about this microcarpa in future slides. So we have these three different clonal walnut rootstocks that are readily avail available in the market, in the uh, commercial nursery trade. RX1, that has the microcarpa parentage, Vlax and VX, Vlach and VX211. And these are, um, these have the Northern California black parentage. These three rootstocks were the outcome of the paradox diversity studies. And when you look at advertisements on these different rootstocks, there's three different ways that they're sold. I mean, I took this from you know, a commercial advertisement from a nursery. And what you'll notice is that when you purchase the rootstocks, the clones in a containerized system, they're advertised as having great defense against crown gall. And I wanted to kind of elaborate on why this is. So why are the clonal rootstocks associated with lower incidence of crown gall, particularly when you're buying them in these containerized pots? So I want you to understand that all three of these commercial rootstocks are susceptible to crown gall. In this photograph, you can see a picture of Vlach, and it was ino inoculated, purposely inoculated with the crown gall causing pathogen, Agrobacterium tumefaciens, and you can clearly see the gall. So they're all susceptible. However, the reason they can be advertised as giving you some protection from Agrobacterium is because of the way they are grown. They're grown in, in sterile systems, 
in the test tube, and then they're grown in um, soilless potting medium that has been sterilized, you know, steamed twice before it's used. So they're grown in such a situation to keep them clean and keep the pathogen out. It's not that the, the plants themselves are resistant. So why is it different than using a seedling system? Well, what I'd like to explain is that when you use a seedling system, you can have exposure to the pathogen. When the seeds, paradox seeds are collected, if they hit the soil, the pathogen can be in soil. Then when those seedlings are germinated in the nursery, such as a nursery here, um, they can end up with, um, with crown gall on the seedlings. Also, even if you put um, clean seeds in the nursery, if that nursery soil had agrobacterium in it, you could end up with crown gall. Or sometimes you'll even have a gall that forms at the graft union, and that could be even from a dirty tool. So this is a chart that's been um, produced by uh, Janine Hasey and others. And um, it talks about the selections of these different rootstocks and what are some of the characteristics based on the information that we have now. And um, on the top here are three different rootstocks, Vlach, VX211, and RX1. And first of all, I'll mention that Vlach and VX211 are considered vigorous and highly vigorous. So a lot of growers like to place them in replant sites where there might be some shading and they just need to get a tree growing quickly. Now RX1, that's the one with the microcarpet in the parentage, has been showing some level of resistance to um, phytophthorids. So in, in situations, orchards where there's replant issues from phytophthora, this might be a better option. And in terms of resistance to agrobacterium, um, RX1 has moderate resistance to low resistance. So there's some potential there in terms of um, moderate resistance to agrobacterium. Now, when we look at nematodes, that VX211 is standing out as having um, ST, some tree tolerance to nematode presence. And I want to also be very clear, it also S means susceptible. So the, the, the uh, nematodes can reproduce on these trees, but there are, there's some tolerance, meaning those trees can still be productive even in the presence of parasitism. So we are now um, multiple years into this second generation of these rootstock trials. And I have one here in Tulare County where we have uh, the Paradox Ceiling rootstock and we have um, the three commercially available clones as well as a suite of um, new rootstocks that we're testing for um, horticultural traits as well as pathogen resistance. And we just had our first commercial um, yield data taken uh, this past October, October 2020. So in these trials um, throughout the state, um, they're in multiple locations throughout the, throughout the state. And we've included some of these new options, like K3, for example, is just microcarpa on its own. And um, I've added in this chart the reasons why we're interested. As I mentioned on the prior slide, um, we're interested in microcarpa in terms of um, its potential for uh, mitigating crown gall, phytophthora, et cetera. And so at this point, I'm going to turn my talk over to Greg Brown, and he's going to take you through um, some of these diseases specifically and how rootstocks can be used to, um, to uh, mitigate these diseases in orchards. So now I'm going to stop screen sharing and see if Greg can share his screen. OK, um, Kelly, I think you indicated you wanted to do one set of questions now. There you go. No. So thank you, Elizabeth. Actually, we will just launch the poll and then we'll do all the question at the end of the two presentations. So yeah, a minute and a half here to um, answer the poll that's on your screen. There are two questions. And then Elizabeth, I'll ask you to just briefly touch to make sure we got the right answers in this these poll and then we'll 
go well in the meantime greg's going to share his screen and get it ready to go and then we'll transition to greg so another minute here okay. i've only got 77 responses so keep clicking away sure um rootstock selection may aid in management of and that would be pests and diseases would be the the best um, answer um, the second question is clonal rootstock lines may be selected for vigor. That would be one thing, for example, um, VX211, um, nematode suppression, VX211, and disease management. And all of so all of the, the above would be the correct answer. Okay. It's perfect. Well, uh, yes. So this is part two. We're continuing on walnut rootstocks, but we're going to zero in on progress and challenges with Phytophthora related to walnut rootstocks. Um, the bridge from Elizabeth's presentation into this one is going to be those second generation orchard trial validations that Elizabeth pointed out. Um, Many of them involve yield collection, but some of them also involve pathogen resistance assessments of elite rootstocks. And um, uh, one of those trials is has been at Davis. I'll talk about that. Um, then I'll step back a little bit, and I'd like to illustrate this rootstock resistance identifica identification pathway, I'm calling it. It's how we get these elite rootstocks in the first place. I'm just gonna use Phytophthora as an example, but you can realize that similar work is, has occurred for crown gall resistance and is occurring for nematode resistance. And then I'd like to conclude with just some practical perspective kind of considerations for management um, of Phytophthora, but also related problems. Then we'll have our questions. Okay, so let's see if, there we go. So first, um, this bridge into Elizabeth's presentation, um, one of the rootstock trials, um, this one uh, coordinated by Catherine Jarvis Sheen up at UC Davis involves several of our uh, pathologists. Um, Dan Klupfel and I um, shared this experiment in assessments of resistance to crown gall and Phytophthora. And uh, the trial was planted in 2016. We included rootstock standards that Elizabeth mentioned, VLACH, RX1, and VX211. Um, their respect, uh, the, the first and the last ones, of course, are paradox involving Northern California black as a maternal parent. And then this RX1 is the one that Elizabeth highlighted as having microcarpa as the black parent. And then we ex uh, included four experimental rootstocks that came up through this pathway that I'll tell you more about next. Um, a year after this trial was planted, we inoculated uh, in Dan Klupfel's case with Agrobacterium tumefaciens or on separate trees. Um, my lab infested the plots near the um, root crowns. I don't know if you can see my pointer, uh, but we infested the soil around the root crowns with two Phytophthora species, Phytophthora cinnamomi and Phytophthora citricola. And then uh, just this last fall, we concluded that experiment with a backhoe and examined the root systems carefully. And here's what we found with respect to Phytophthora. Um, without infesting the soil and the control, um, no, no crown rot occurred um, that would be uh, what Phytophthora would cause. And then in the Phytophthora inoculated plots, um, our susceptible standard, well, semi-susceptible standard, blatch, 90% of the trees showed Phytophthora crown rot. RX1, none of the trees did show any crown rot. VX211, 76%. And then among the four experimental rootstock clones that we were testing, um, zero to 76%. So uh, one of them had zero and the other uh, 
three had some levels of crown rot, one of them pretty high, the 76. Then uh, we did, these are symptoms you see in the tree trunks, lower part of the Phytophthora crown rot. Uh, the last one is RX1, we saw no crown rot on it. Um, and then we conducted isolations to make sure uh, what we thought was infection by Phytophthora was in fact was. And it was turned out to be Phytophthora cinnamomy that was causing the damage. Okay. So now um, we just like to try kind of trace the pathway. How do we get those elite uh, rootstock clones in the first place? And um, you'll recognize this slide from John Priest, um, who runs the USDA National Clonal Germplasm Repository. Uh, basically, our uh, system starts with the germplasm. And you'll see here highlighted Juglans regia, the Microcarpa, Californica, Elantifolia, other blacks in the background. And uh, we've started with this germplasm, working with the Walnut Impro Improvement Program and others. Uh, the knowledge is there to do the cross-pollinations needed, the hybridizations. And then through lots of teamwork, we do what we call the phenotyping. Uh, selecting for resistance, and we get these candidate root stocks. So that's the basic system. And I will illustrate this system for Phytophthora further um, by kind of charting the path for RX1, the Microcarpa Viregia hybrid that we have for resistance to Phytophthora available now. Um, we started with screening in the greenhouse uh, with, with uh, Phytophthora citricola and cinnamomy, and we identified uh, seedlings that had resistance, retested them as clones in the greenhouse. And then uh, once we thought we had something good, we still were uncertain because the greenhouse is certainly not the orchard. So um, with farm advisor Joe Grant, we, we kind of went the next step. Joe had identified an orchard where we found Phytophthora cinnamomy present and really causing lots of damage, as you see in this photo. And on the right side of the images, um, you'll see this square area. And we thought that'd be a great site to test the resistance of RX1. So, um, what Joe Grant did, um, he planted RX1 next to a standard paradox seedling uh, tree at each of the sites um, where trees had been removed. Um, these were pre-plant fumigated before the tree planting, but uh, with methyl bromide, just, just spot treated. And so all we would get there is a slight delay in Phytophthora reinfestation. <clears throat> so that shows right after planting. And then um, as the years went on, what we observed is that paradox seed, trees on paradox seedling, um, even though they got started initially, they had in, uh, gradually started dying out to the point where we had lost over 40% of the trees uh, by about 2012. And um, our isolations confirmed that the death of the paradox seedling trees was due to infection by Phytophthora cinnamomy. Uh, continuing on, this is a, a Google image of the trial in 2017. And you can see that all of these tree sites have trees in them. There's some that were smaller because they were regrafted. The, they, the initial graft attempt failed. Um, at this point, all the paradox seedling trees had been removed by the grower and all that's left is, R, is RX1. And then here's a, a years later shot, Joe Grant kind of hiding here, but um, he's, he's happy with his um, uh, no mortality on RX1 rootstock. Okay, so that's kind of, uh, that's the, um, pat, the kind of pathway that we're following for not only Phytophthora, but ultimately um, 
crown gall and, uh, res and resistance to nematodes. Um, okay, but now we're kind of back in the greenhouse again. Um, this cycle keeps starting over and over again as we um, identify promising uh, parental materials for development of rootstocks. Um, we are emphasizing resistance not only to Phytophthora, but also to crown gall and root lesion nematode. My colleagues, uh, Dan Klupfel and Andreas Westfall are leading the uh, uh, crown gall and nematode research, of course. Um, a real promising thing that has happened along the way with the input of uh, genomics specialists in the Walnut Improvement Program uh, efforts, um, we have identified as a team a, what we call a quantitative trait locus and markers for that. And this locus that can be um, monitored with these markers um, happens to be the same for both crown gall and Phytophthora. And we have some ideas for why that might be, but um, at least some of the, res a major portion of resistance to each of these pathogens happens to be marked in the same way in these walnut genomes. And so that the good thing about that is it, it makes it promising that we can get rootstocks that are both crown gall and phytophthora resistant at the same time. And hopefully that will help us to find a rootstock that also has nematode resistance. Okay, um, so this just illustrates the broad range in response of resistance phenotypes to phytophthora. And you, 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 know, you see uh, standards on the left that are susceptible and resistant and then the, the broad range of expression, even among uh, Micrococcobiregia hybrids, which is where RX1 came from. But indeed, uh, Microcarpa is our source of resistance, both for Phytophthora and Agrobacterium. Okay, so we are continuing that work um, with elite colonial selections, and then we're also validating the quantitative trait locus uh, back to seedling populations of microcarpa hybrids again. And you see some of that work going on here. And um, throughout this whole process, uh, we select individuals, um, seedlings or clones that have performed well, that are very promising, the least disease susceptible um, of the lots, and they are clonally propagated for ultimate uh, orchard validations. Um, this slide just kind of summarizes where we are. We've got uh, a large number of clones that have been propagated at the nursery level. And uh, I've just illustrated their um, responses to Phytophthora. Um, not all of them are highly resistant to Phytophthora, but some of them were selected for their nematode resistance um, and crown gall resistance. But anyway, this process uh, will continue. Um, okay, so for the concluding, the concluding thoughts that I'd like to think, I'd like you to think about in relation to managing Phytophthora, um, this presentation has highlighted genetic resistance, and and I'm a firm believer that that is a foundation for managing Phytophthora stock resistance. But um, obviously, uh, careful soil water management is very important. And we've talked about that in other presentations, how it fits in with the biology of Phytophthora. Avoiding contamination of orchards that are currently clean is very important. In some cases, even uh, systemic uh, oomycete controlling materials are useful. Um, but in relation to that, that last case of chemical control, I think it, it emphasizes the, th the second consideration that I'd like to emphasize here. Um, and that is that reliable diagnosis of Phytophthora crown and root rot requires a couple of things. Um, one is that you need 
consistent symptoms typical of what those by Toffler would cause, the root and crown rot uh, that, that is distinctive for that caused by Phytophthora. And then a uh, second thing is species specific laboratory diagnostics. Um, I would say that I've seen quite a few misdiagnoses and uh, I would say that myself and others that know about Phytophthora often do have to rely on lab diagnostics to confirm their suspicions. Um, there are many things that can be confused with Phytophthora. Here's a few examples. Um, Armillaria is not that hard to distinguish, but on top, the trees collapse very similarly. They do have root and crown rot um, on them, but you get the, um, the visible sign distinction of the mycelial plaques armillaria causes. And if you're super observant, you might find these rhizomorphs. Um, also in the fall, you can find the diagnostic mushrooms. A little harder distinction here on the next slide. The, um, on the left, you see an image of Phytophthora infection by citric, Phytophthora citricola. On the right, you see another type of crown rot that we call paradox canker. It has not been consistently associated with any pathogen. Uh, we are still working on what the pathogen is. It does seem to have a pathogen because it's a graft transmissible um, necrosis, uh, but you could see possible confusion between these things. You will isolate Phytophthora or be able to laboratory diagnose it if, if you do a good thorough job on the left as Phytophthora, but the right thing, you will not detect Phytophthora from that and you would be wasting money on systemic fungicides if you were using them to control by, um, paradox canker. Okay, another a little harder example is water logging. Uh, trees can decline on top, either like this yellowing or even uh, in severe cases die. And in some cases, we do not see uh, the root rot that Phytophthora would cause, we only see um, what looks like waterlogging symptoms on the roots. We'll often see these symptoms such as Bruce Lampinen pointed out yesterday, uh, the leaf scorching in association with yellowing. And on the roots, um, on the right here, this is actually from the rootstock trial that I showed you uh, at the beginning. Um, another symptom of waterlogging is these enlarged lenticels, this kind of blotchy root rot as opposed to the continuous necrosis that Phytophthora would cause. So uh, you can see that uh, care is used in, care must be used in properly diagnosing uh, root and crown rots in your orchard. And that's the point. Okay. So um, that's all I had, thank you. And I'll let Mohammed put our questions up, I guess. Perfect, thank you so much, Greg and Elizabeth. That was very good and informative presentation. But first we'll start with the poll, APR credit. And uh, Kelly, she already launched the poll, so we'll have one minute, right, Kelly? Yeah, one minute and make sure you scroll down. There are three questions in this one. So use the toggle to make sure to scroll down and answer all three questions. And then Greg, once we close it, if you can, before we go to the Q&A section, just answer the poll question so that everyone has it right for the exam that's going to be emailed after the event. So another 45 seconds here, we've got only 12 votes. I'll give you a little bit longer of time since there are three questions not just two questions on these ones. So go ahead and submit your answers. And Greg, can you just go over them real quick? Okay, um, crown and or root rots of walnut can be caused by, and um, the, the correct answer is the last one, all of the above. Um, of the currently available rootstocks, which one exhibits the greatest resistance to Phytophthora pseudomomy? And that is Rx1. Um, let's see, and then I'm not, I'm gonna have to scroll down here. 
There we go. Um, last one, reliable diagnosis of a Phytophthora disease problem is best achieved by, um, the answer is disease symptoms typical of those caused by Phytophthora combined with species specific laboratory diagnostics. And that one's kind of a tricky one. I didn't, I didn't quite give everybody all the information they needed. ELISA tests, at least um, most of them that I've ever been exposed to do, are not able to get to species level. And they even can have a problem with getting to genus level. So that means uh, they may cross re react with some Pythium species and they cannot get you to the species level ID. Now, as a grower or a manager, when you get a species specific ID of Phytophthora, I think you can, assuming they're correct, you can have confidence that that was a good test. Okay. Sure. I'll, anybody has questions uh, later so, can yeah. check in with me. You, Greg, for that, we have a few questions for you and Elizabeth. This first question, I think it's, Maybe Elizabeth, she can answer it. When you talk, uh, excuse me. So when you talk about uh, paradox seedling as control, is this truly uniform genotype? Same for nursery stock scale paradox. Um, well, the paradox seedling, it's really what is, I would say it's just a commercial standard is what we would call it um, in terms of a control treatment but it is a seedling population. So they are not genetically uniform to each other. So it's, we would call it a commercial standard because it would, it would be what would be commercially available as um, in a seedling population. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Elizabeth. Another question from Bob Bidi to Greg. Is well water a common source for Phytophthora? And uh, where that, just one second. Uh, and is there any tests that have been done to uh, Phytophthora species identification? Um, let's see, the, the first question, um, yeah. Bob's a great educator, he's making sure I cover things. Um, no, well water is not a source of Phytophthora. There's nothing for it to eat down there in your groundwater. And so, you know, it's just, it's not gonna be there. And then, uh, was that the next question? Mohammed? Yeah, so uh, uh, yeah, this, this is, I think, and he has other question actually. Bob, how important is to keep the crown of the walnut root stock dry from frequent uh, wetting from irrigation? Another educator question. Thank you, Bob. Uh, it is very important. And uh, if you have um, impact sprinklers, you know, the splitters can be helpful in doing that. Um, you can get lucky and may not need to do the, the keeping the crown dry, but it's just a good practice to avoid risk. Perfect. Thank you, Greg. So we have other question from Maria. Uh, if RX1 is the most resistant, then how does one to replant if it is the best vigorous? What would be the best way to do a replant with RX? I well, was just Elizabeth, um, trying to type. Sorry. So comment, Elizabeth? Sure. Um, well, when we say RX1 is the least vigorous, you have to remember that that's statistically speaking in comparison to VX211 and Vlach. That's not suggesting that it's not, um, if you look at it on its own, as though it's not vigorous. That's really mentioned in comparison to those other two. And I have RX1, for example, in our walnut rootstock plot down here. And I realized that I had almost a prejudice to the, um, the genotype because of microcarpa, like just that micro being in the, um, in, in the parentage, that word. But I somehow uh, I think I thought it was going to be small and it, it it's actually performing really well. So I think you just have to remember um, what it's being compared to when we when we make those tables. 
Yeah, in the image that Elizabeth and I both showed of microcarpa, that is the maternal parent. When you hybridize it with Juglans regia, you get a hybrid vigor um, from that. And so as Elizabeth pointed out, um, RX1 um, is not as vigorous as Flatch or VX211 in some settings, but it's right up there uh, with Paradox. It has good vigor. Yeah, I would, chime, I would chime in and say that with the rootstock um, uh, site that I have, we've also seen that RX1 is, is, is a champion. So I wouldn't get too caught up in that. Thank you, Gary. So yeah, we RX1 have another... in my trial is performing very, very well. Yeah. That's good. <coughs> okay, so let's move to a very quick last question. In terms of uh, Phytophthora disease prevention, which type of irrigation methods are best to use uh, in one-not orchards? Well, I guess I'll comment. Um, I think that you can manage Phytophthora adequately with many types of irrigation, um, even including flood irrigation, if you have good berms and good soil drainage. Uh, the key is just care to meet ET needs without waterlogging around, especially around the root crowns. It can be easier to do that on some soils with um, micro sprinklers that are designed not to keep the root crowns wet or strategically used drip systems. So if you don't mind, um, I, I can't type in a, a question into the Q&A because I'm, I'm a panelist. So I yes, just wanted, I wanted to toss out one more question because we do have some extra time. So I thought that I would put this in there. So we have time. So yeah, so Greg, could you elaborate a little bit on what you mean by cra graft transmissible? What does that mean on the pathology side? Does it mean that it's like out there spreading in grafts or does that, is that a testing thing that you do in lab in in uh, field assays. Oh, okay. Um, and this is I think this is in relation to the paradox canker disease that kind of looks like Phytophthora in some ways, but it's it's not caused by Phytophthora. Is that right? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's one of those educator questions where. Okay. Um, I don't want too much confusion Good. from the comment. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's a good point. Um, do not be worried that when your trees are grafted, you're gonna get paradox canker. That's not what I meant. Uh, another educator, thank you. Um, so all I meant was when we experimentally took discs of um, necrotic bark from the edge of a paradox canker, we were able, able to take that necrosis to a healthy tree and um, patch it into the bark of that healthy tree and observe that the canker uh, spread into the healthy tree. That's what I meant by graft transmission. Um, we did have to you know, treat it like a graft in, in terms of sealing it well, fitting it well, and uh, nailing it on uh, like a like a bark patch graft, but in no way was this process similar or does it have anything to say about, you know, grafting at the nursery? Um, there's no connection of grafting at the nursery with this paradox canker disease. Did I, did I answer that okay, Carrie, or you wanna to add to that? Yes, I think that was fantastic. It, it okay. is a, okay. it's a test, okay. it's a test that you were using to show that something was moving but we don't know what it was. And that's, yeah. that's all it was. Okay, and then Robert Longstreth question, is Phytophthora a younger tree problem? Um, I would say an almond right now, um, it's a pretty significant young tree problem. Uh, there's also old tree problems on almond, but um, on walnut, mm, no, I, I wouldn't say it's limited to young trees. Uh, you know, we, we lose a lot of big sections of orchard if there's Phytophthora cinnamomi, um, even in, you know, established orchards. Uh, but things change over time. So 
Robert, if you think otherwise, um, let us know. Thank you so much, uh, Rick. Thanks, Gary, for the question and Roberts. So um, we still have some time for another questions. If not, we can move to the next presentation. So our next presenter will be uh, Jim Adaskavich. Jim, he's a professor and plant pathologist at the UC Riverside. Uh, Jim's research program focuses on disease of tree crops and includes study on the biology, epidemiology, and management of pre and post harvest foliar and root diseases caused by fungal and bacterial pathogen. So Jim, we are glad to and honored to have you uh, with us today and listen to your updates on the walnut blights. So thank you for the introduction, Mo. And um, we are going to talk about epidemiology and management of walnut blight and just given folks on the update, which is what the title was. Obviously, we're working on uh, walnut blight for several years, but there's some uh, pressing issues that we're going to talk about today. And uh, the, there's some urgency to develop new uh, treatments. The walnut blight is a bacterial disease caused by Xanthomonas arbicula pathovar juglandis. Uh, it's a long name, we call, we call it XAJ for short. Uh, the pathogen survives in buds, in between the bud scales of living flowers, and it also survives in catkins. Uh, male uh, flowers as well as female flowers can uh, harbor the pathogen, and um, the buds, flowers, leaves, and fruit are susceptible to the disease. And we're trying to uh, get people to be aware that uh, cankers can also occur with uh, walnut blight. And so some of the newer varieties, we see lots of uh, cankers, and then these can be subsequently uh, colonized. Uh, fruit infections are the main uh, source of direct crop loss uh, and lowering quality. Uh, and we get these black uh, irregular lesions on the hull. These progress into the kernel and again, result in nut drop and uh, all kinds of quality issues. And so there's direct crop loss. So the disease cycle of walnut blight is um, uh, not that complicated. Uh, we see that uh, the, as the buds, if we start in the upper left, uh, the buds will start to expand. The uh, catkins are gonna male flowers, they're gonna expand. And in between those scales, uh, the bacteria is harboring. And so as the, fruit, if the flower expands, uh, if it rains, these bacteria are going to be liberated uh, from those uh, tight spaces. And the female flowers are also a uh, source of inoculum. And so as the terminal, the larger buds start to uh, open up again, if there's rain, these things will disseminate and uh, 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 cause the bacterium to get into the uh, through the stomata and natural openings and cause disease. Now there's many strains and this is a, a misunderstanding in the literature we've been doing. This upper gel there just shows all these different bands. And so what we're showing here is that, you know, the pop, there's a population out there. And just like there's a population of people with different genetic backgrounds, uh, there's also a, a genetic diversity to the pathogen in, in California. And we've identified at least uh, four or five different uh, strains that are predominant. And so this is a source of uh, diversity, which is a source of developing uh, resistance. So um, if we plate these things out, these yellow bacteria, not all the yellow bacteria are Xanthomonas. So we've, we've warned and told people in the past that uh, you, just because you see a yellow bacterium doesn't mean you can quantify uh, bud populations. And so, um, that's, that's a big uh, issue. And so we, we've developed some molecular primers to uh, identify these yellow bacteria as the XAJ pathogen. So if we go to the right, upper right, so those, as those buds open up, the male or female, this is the inoculum source. 
and uh, these are going to infect. And so we have two types of, of um, oops, easy. two types of uh, infections. End blight is when we usually see there's a concentration of stomata at the tip where the pistillate flower uh, gets pollinized. That's a that black spot. We call that end blight. And then um, uh, to the if there's secondary inoculum being produced, we'll see side blight. And so that's in the lower right. So the disease is very complex in the sense that if, if we don't have the rain and the conducive environments, the right temperatures, the disease can be monocyclic, meaning that there's only one infection period, usually at the tip of that, uh, the end blight symptom, the tip of the uh, pistillate flower, which is, becomes the fruit. If there is rain in moisture, we can see that the organism with multiple side uh, infections, side blight infections, we can see that the disease is polycyclic. And so then uh, we can see this thing infecting leaves, it can infect uh, shoots, and it can be uh, getting into overwintering as uh, spreading, its, spreading the cells of the bacterium into new buds that are developing, and then they harbor as an epiphyte in between the bud scales, but they can also harbor in, in these changers that we're talking about. Well, anyway, so we've been isolating, this was on the cultivar Teleri, um, different uh, types of symptoms. And th during the walnut blight meeting, uh, the walnut meeting this year with the researchers, we were talking about how some of these symptoms can be different from walnut blight. And one of the ways uh, we can separate that as we could see these uh, connections, um, these infections in the early spring uh, developing. So those are uh, some of the symptoms uh, of the canker that we're pointing, the red arrows pointing to the different uh, margins of the uh, infection there caused by the walnut blight pathogen. These black uh, catkins are, are blighted. And so there's another example of blighted uh, cane, uh, blighted flowers, the male flowers during wet weather. So the research updates, this is what we're going to focus on, uh, just pointing out the genetic diversity the, uh, of the pathogen, developing screening methods. We're working with the breeding program, uh, Chuck Leslie, Pat Brown, and uh, others. Uh, we're testing some of these uh, advanced uh, selections that they're going through the breeding program, and we're developing some new techniques there. Then, of course, we're focused on new bacteria sites and uh, looking at uh, some of the big issues coming up that I'll explain uh, the changes with uh, some of our export markets. So first of all, we're characterizing the pathogen. It's, uh, there's a lots of yellow bacteria and other colors as you see in the uh, upper left. There's different colored bacteria. Uh, the yellow bacteria is the uh, pathogen and uh, we can streak these out. And so we're streaking out in the bottom middle, these squiggly lines, we streak out the yellow bacteria and then we can identify and determine So we use PCR primers that we've developed that are very specific, and we can show that uh, about 67 or 70 percent, roughly, of the yellow uh, bacteria are the XAJ. So we can uh, quantify, but it's uh, still difficult to, to do just without some molecular techniques. Uh, this is further fingerprinting to show the diversity of the uh, pathogen. Uh, we, we can see that uh, we use REP. Eric in box uh, primers to uh, characterize the different. So each lane here in the, in the picture, uh, it's illustrating different uh, strains because they have different banding patterns, as you can see here, um, to um, show the diversity of these different isolates of the pathogen. So they're not all alike. And uh, in this particular one, we've, uh, we have uh, up to eight different uh, genotypes identified. Uh, and still about five or six predominant throughout California. Uh, obviously, this uh, uh, is an indication of how 
so you can have a quick adaptation to different types of environments. And so these populations fluctuate. And so it isn't always constant. Um, and so on the right-hand side, we developed a specific primer uh, to identify that. And that band is indicating the uh, specific um, uh, specificity of the primer in identifying the XAJ uh, isolates. So um, the inoculum uh, inoculation methods, this is part of the bleeding program. Um, what we're uh, talking about is that uh, uh, <clears throat> we've been looking at different selections from earliest to Chernovo to Manregion, for example, and comparing these to the um, comparing these to the uh, uh, standard varieties like Chandler and Ivan uh, Payne and Ashley and Vina. And so, on the bottom there of the far left graph, this is the natural incidence, and you can see the the relatively uh, higher disease level, 75% incidence, for example, in Vina. And then we can see that Chernovo and this uh, Manregion and some of these other selections are, are less showing disease. And so this is part of how we're uh, to quantify these. And we do these different methods looking at surfactants and adding to the inoculum. And usually the surfactants are increasing uh, the levels of disease. And so that's how you can overcome the waxy surfaces, which is a, is a, a barrier, a natural barrier to, um, to uh, infection that the plant has. So if it can beat up the water and prevent the water from spreading, uh, that's, a, that's called a preformed natural uh, host defense mechanism. But to overcome that, we add surfactants, which then allow the bacteria into the uh, into the plant and through the stomata, lowering the surface tension to cause a continuous film of water. So uh, anyways, we're doing these, this research to compare these things. And then the, you can see on the lower right, um, you can see how we've inoculated these. And even under the worst case scenario, we can get to Novo shows very low, 76, 80, just a few spots. But you can see that Pain, uh, Sinensis, Ashley, and, and others are showing uh, greater uh, disease by the infections. All those little black dots are showing you know, the uh, infections. So we've done a lot of work uh, to help the breeding program. And so, but, you know, looking at fruit takes years to uh, uh, get to the trees big enough to produce crop. And so we're trying to develop other things by looking at bud populations as well. Can, can resistant uh, varieties or selections uh, be identified early based on uh, their, their uh, way of supporting the uh, bacterium in the, in the buds? And so this is a good, another good uh, test that we're following. And so uh, we're focusing on fruit and we're focusing on uh, bud populations. And so again, and again, these, these methods that we're using are basically looking at the different uh, types of resistance from pre-infection mechanisms to post-infection mechanisms uh, uh, for blocking or holding back the pathogen from colonizing the host. So in this slide, uh, we were looking at survival over from 2018 to 2019. And then we were looking at the amount of disease in 2020. And so uh, over the last couple of years, we've been getting very consistent results. And so you can see 2018, 2019 bars, those are two years of data. The, all the bars on the left-hand side of the uh, graph are showing low levels of uh, bud uh, populations. And uh, we say consistent low populations on these, so all the blue ones are showing the selections in 2020 that had low bud populations and low disease in the subsequent year of 2020. Um, we have some intermediate uh, selections that are more variable, and then we have uh, the selections that are uh, more consistently with high populations, and then they have, as the yellow and red dots, have, have uh, high bud populations and high disease in the subsequent year of 2020. So we're looking at bud populations in 2018 and 19, and then we're looking at disease 
by these blue dots here at how much disease occurred in uh, 2020 in consistent data to help the breeding program give them another trait that they can look for is all these selections from 1747 all the way over to uh, say 24.27, these are uh, those 10, eight, 10 uh, selections would be a, a good characteristic to, if they have the nut characteristics and other horticultural characteristics, these, this would be the ones to move forward with blight resistance. And so that's how we're uh, trying to give in to the, uh, to the uh, breeding program to give them uh, more information on walnut blight resistance based on bud populations, how well the genotypes support the bacterial bud population. And so uh, we, th we still think those varieties can be tested for fruit infections later. And so we continue to do those fruit infections, inoculations as the selections get more advanced over the years that they're propagated and grown out. And if they make all the horticultural characteristics and they make the blight resistance, now we have varieties in the future that can be uh, sold as blight and uh, blight resistant and have the characteristic nut characteristics for excellent marketing. So these assays that we're doing are showing us very good data. There's good relationships between bud populations and natural blight incidents in subsequent years. Correlating this data to help again to show that uh, this is a, a one strategy to look for uh, resistance in walnut blight, uh, walnut blight resistant genotypes of walnut. The other thing we're looking at is uh, uh, these bud populations in the field and how well these, um, they, do they uh, associate themselves with uh, cankers. And so we've been looking at uh, twigs with cankers and you see all the cultivars on the far left from Ashley all the way to Chandler. Uh, there, are, there are twigs uh, without cankers and twigs with cankers. We do a PCR rating of these and then we played them out on the, on the two columns to the far right. We played those out we have twigs without cankers and twigs with cankers. And we're looking at um, the association of bud populations with cankers. So if cankers are rains, they're, they're oozing out the bacteria, then all the bud, all the bud pop to those cankers are going to be uh, colonized. So these darker orange colors with threes and twos are indicating that, um, that the buds are more uh, associated with cankers have higher uh, populations of the pathogen. And last year, we also did some work on uh, determining uh, what's the incidence of cankers uh, uh, being collected that uh, have XAJ. And so you can see we the seven hey, Jim. on April 8th and two of them. bar here. Okay, so um, again, I was just uh, isolating at different times here, different cankers collected 7 and 19 for April 8th and 20th, and we're showing that the 2 to 7 uh, of the, the cankers were positive. So this is roughly about 40%, uh, 30% uh, of the cankers uh, were positive for XAJ when we isolated from them. So let's move on to the efficacy of uh, new bactericides. And one of the bad news I have to maybe is the industry, uh, the, the European Union or the EU is going to uh, cancel MRLs for Mancozeb. And although we're using Mancozeb early in the season, uh, it, it's one of those types of materials that lasts a long long time and um, what can happen okay I'm sorry about that let's see if we can get this going again so uh, 
the, with the Mankozeb issue is that the EU is uh, planning to uh, cancel Mankozeb. So um, there's always a potential for um, contamination with Mankozeb because it's a long lasting, very persistent uh, material. And although it's a contact material, um, if it's on the fruit and the hulls and as it's hauled, there, there's water being used, it can be carried into the kernels. And if they detect it, uh, they can close the market. So it's best that uh, we, we uh, realize that the market is about 38% of California walnuts goes to the EU. And so this is a, a large number and we really can't afford to uh, lose uh, that market. So it, it just emphasized the need to develop alternatives in the next uh, year or two. Uh, the good news for this year is that uh, there was a lot of issues with the EPA um, with uh, uh, issues about uh, allowing uh, walnut orchards to, to be treated with pesticides, fungicides, insecticides, and so forth when they're standing water. Um, this was a big issue and it was uh, we had to put in uh, section 24 C's or special local needs and uh, the walnut industry has applied for uh, copper and diethane to be, or mancozeb to be um, allowed to be applied in when there's puddles, standing water in the orchard. Uh, you can't apply these fungicides or insecticides or any pesticide when there's, unless you have this 24C now, because uh, the potential of contaminating surface water. Uh, and so we're trying to say, if there is no uh, running water in the orchard, moving water in the orchard, then there's no risk. You could have standing water. And so that's what the section 24C is going to allow the Ag Commissioners to allow applications when it's determined that there's no moving water in the orchard from a flood, for example, or near a river. But there could be standing water, uh, which is puddles, and you can still apply. So that's that's what we're trying to accomplish with these 24Cs. And diethane's it uh, looks like it's going to be approved, and now we're waiting for the copper just in time for the, the um, season to begin. Well, anyways, we've been looking at different treatments. Obviously, copper is very important. Um, Kasugamycin is relatively new and becoming very important. We're fighting to get uh, MycoShield, the fire line, the oxytetracycline uh, registered, and uh, we're looking at new materials uh, to evaluate, uh, for, to replace the, um, eventually, Mankozeb if we're going to be shipping to the e EU. So uh, one of the things that we want to point out here um, is that when we sample these isolates from different orchards where there's pro problems or failures in management, we're seeing that, uh, that the number of isolates that we're getting are getting more and more higher. So if you look at to resistant to copper, so if you look at that resistant to copper at 50 ppm, that's about 50%, 12 out of 24 um, isolates that we recovered were resistant at 50. But five out of 24, you know, which is about 25, 24, 25% is getting to re become resistant to 100 parts per million. And in other parts of the world, like in China, they're reporting even 200 parts per million uh, resistance. And so as because resistance developed before we introduced Mankozeb, so then you develop another mode of action, but there's already resistance to the first mode of action. That means that although you have, two di you have a second mode of action there, like the Mankozeb, the selection process still uh, is going on. It, it, but the rate of selection has been slowed but it's still what that means is that we're still pushing that copper level of uh, reduced sensitivity to copper to higher and higher levels. So again, it's really important that we develop different modes of action so that we can rotate between different modes of action and prevent uh, the resistance. The good news is that Mankozeb here is still uh, very uh, effective, and the uh, you can see by these very low numbers the. Uh, Mancozeb is inhibiting at, at very low numbers. And so um, we're, we're happy about that. Um, in Florida, 
uh, they've completely lost Mankozeb activity to Xanthomonas species that attack solanaceous crops. So we're constantly monitoring these uh, AIs, copper and Mankozeb, uh, to ensure that we still have effective treatments. And so even though the copper resistance is going higher, uh, the Mankozeb is holding it in place and still allowing it to be effective in our programs. Kasugamycin is very important. It's a new bacteria site that was registered. It's a different mode of action. It's very important to integrate this to reduce the total number of uh, applications of Mancozeb and copper. That's one way to sustain their uh, viability. Um, this new Kasugamycin, it is, I call it a bacteria site, but the EPA calls it an antibiotic. But it has a different mode of action, a unique mode of action compared to other uh, antibiotics. And there's for this particular material, there's no human or animal uses. And that's why the EPA allowed uh, for its registration. Um, it breaks down to near zero levels within 30 days. And so there's very little uh, con possible contamination at harvest of our kernels. Uh, no worker safety issues. And uh, well, this is, we're not going to be promoting resistance to non-target uh, pathogens because we're limiting the number of sprays uh, per season. So the good news is that uh, we have this uh, registration on walnut since 2018. The rate is 64 fluid ounces per 100 gallons and the maximum number of applications was two. But now the federal label was changed to four. But again, we, I was told that uh, unfortunately the um, current label says two and it's going to take a lot of work to change that for this season. So we're probably going to be limited to two because that's the current label. But for next year, the federal label has changed to four. And so we'll be able to do uh, four applications per season uh, in 2022 um, with the label change once the new labels are printed and uh, the old product is used. Uh, so anyways, um, <clears throat> we ask for these things to be uh, with re-entry times of 12 hours, which is very short. And we ask for 24 seats, but uh, the EPA says no. So that leaves us with the copper mango zeb for the 24 C this coming year. Um, oxytetracycline has been submitted to the EPA and uh, is supposed to be registered in April uh, 2021. And the good news is we also identified dodine. Uh, this is a fungicide. Uh, and we're looking at this and it uh, uh, has some bactericidal activity. And so we are planning to test this on a large scale this year uh, to uh, evaluate it as a substitute for Mancozeb so that in 2022, we'll be able to uh, meet all the EU uh, standards. And this has already been re registered federally uh, and in the state, but again, the label uh, is gonna have to be changed uh, for the 2022 season. So this year we're gonna be doing tests on, with growers on a limited scale, but still we'll, we'll be prepared for coming the coming year. Uh, some of our in vitro tests, you see we have dodine here. It has this long chain and it's very uh, active as a bactericide with a membrane disruption. And uh, we see here that dodine at five parts per million and uh, this is the metallic copper equivalent of 0.5 was completely inhibitory to both copper, the bottom circled in red and shows that the activity of the, um, uh, that mixture in uh, inhibiting the pathogen. We're also testing other uh, materials. And one of the new things we're looking at with uh, a new registrant is uh, nicin and polylysine mixed with uh, capric and caprylic acids, which is registered as DART. And so these new materials are very exciting because uh, they're food preservatives and they have FDA approval, but we have to get them registered as EPA approved products through the bio pesticide program. And so we're hopeful that this with the registrant in place, that this will move forward now as a, a bio pesticides to develop different modes of action uh, for controlling walnut blight. And you can see here the nicin and the polylysine uh, you, upper left plate there, the spiral plate showing the bacteria, the control. And there's literally uh, logged eight number of bacteria there. That's uh, the equivalent of 10 uh, million uh, bacteria. And then the nicin 
uh, at these low rates of 500 and 1,000 and polylysine can reduce those things by log five uh, uh, amounts, log six amounts, which is excellent for uh, reducing the pathogen. And, uh, and inoculum levels really indicate what the potential is for infection. But anyways, we're going to these, our trials here, and you can see we do a lot of uh, 15 different treatments here. And we rank these, we have the biologicals up on the top. Uh, Blossom Protect is still doing a great job as a biological, reducing the disease from about 45% uh, down to uh, 20%. Uh, the CX6700 is a experimental um, phage material and uh, it also has some uh, benefits. We looked at natural products like uh, Backstop and EF400. These are essential oils that have uh, bactericidal effects. And we looked at experimental compounds like TDA, NC1. And again, you can see those are BC groups. Um, we're excited about the Nicin Dart uh, that reduced things down to a CD group. Uh, and that means we're down to around 10%. And uh, that's very good uh, for a pure material that we're tank mixing with something. It's not an agro formulation. This is again, what they use as a food preservative and we're just mixing it in the tank and applying it. And so we're gonna hopefully have some new formulations from the registrant this year to uh, pr prevent degradation. Uh, the polylysine with the ampersand, the surfactant did really well, also a BCD group and Kasumin, uh, Manze, Microshield Dart, and uh, new fireline dart uh, were down in the C groups, now CD groups. And uh, we're comparing these to our copper uh, mixed with manzate, which are in the lower bottom ones. Uh, and again, those have the less than 5% disease compared to 45% with these four spray uh, programs. Um, we tried super tin this year and uh, the e it looked pretty good, but uh, the EPA says super tin can't be registered. Uh, no more, no new registrations will be allowed. And one of our best treatments numerically was this mixture of CS2005 mixed uh, at 27 fluid ounces with CHAMP. So that's a fixed copper with a copper sulfate material mixed with manzate. And uh, that gave us uh, the, the highest uh, level of control. Uh, in a second trial, we did uh, again, uh, looking at the biocontrollers on the top. Uh, we've shown significant reductions, but uh, still some of the natural products that we tested uh, looked better than others. And so this ET91 did really well. So we're planning to do additional work with that. Um, again, looking at the rotations of antibiotics, we're getting very good control uh, with um, uh, some of these uh, uh, treatments of Microshield with copper and Microshield with LI700 and uh, new fire line with LI700 and new fire line with CHAMP. These are reducing these things to the lowest levels of that we have seen in less than 5% uh, disease. Uh, some of the new coppers are also looking very good. Masticot's a liquid copper mixed with manzate and we're getting uh, pretty good control with it. And so we're uh, happy with that uh, program. I'm running out of time here. so. I'm just gonna emphasize that uh, with uh, issues coming up with uh, selecting for copper resistance and potentially losing Mancozeb to EU, and, and I'm scared to death about the Mancozeb uh, issue in Florida because they have their Xanthomonas is resistant to it now. So we have to uh, bear in mind to sustain the industry, we have to rotate between different modes of action. And so these are suggested uh, programs. Here's a four spray program for the South Valley, copper mancozeb, consuming mancozeb, consuming copper, and then cop back to copper mancozeb. Um, we reduced the copper by 25% and we reduced the mancozeb by 25% in that first scheme. In the North Valley where there's more rains, you might have to do four or five sprays, but here's another uh, suggested spray program. When we use the, the Kasumin and the alternative materials, the, the best way to use them as we're showing is within seven to 10 day intervals. And we lose efficacy if we go to 14 or 21 day intervals. So we wanna follow the rules for resistance management, use uh, different modes of action. We're trying to get oxytetracycline registered in April, and that's an exciting new development. 
And we're showing that mixtures with DART, uh, with uh, the new, uh, both with the antibiotics and with these uh, food preservatives is look, looking very good. Um, using uh, the labeled rate of 64 fluid ounces of casumin is uh, the proper way to use uh, that material and uh, try to stay with using the labeled rates and don't use off-labeled rates. Um, limiting the number of applications uh, to two, then rotating to another one. And then next year we'll have four uh, for consuming. So you can uh, use two and then switch to, um, like I showed you in those diagrams to like copper man uh, rotation program. Educate yourself. Consuming has to be used in a seven to 10 day rotation. And you can't really, uh, if you go longer, you lose performance. And starting programs, if you look back at that program that I just showed you, if you start programs with uh, broad spectrum things like copper, mancozeb, that reduces the total population. And then the casumin copper and the casumin mancozeb will work better in that situation because uh, casumin is a single site mode of action material. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'll stop there. Uh, we're a couple, we have a couple minutes before time. Goes. Thank you so much, uh, Jim. As usual, it's a huge. Uh, and very informative work. Thank you so much. You're so welcome. we have the poll. So one minute to answer questions, please. So you, I could read this question if you like. Uh, can yes, so uh, we will wait until we get the uh, the answers, and okay. then you can explain the uh, the answers. <clears throat> so we have one minute. So the results are on the screen. If you don't mind going over them, Jim. Okay. The first question is: Can the XAJ pathogen caused twig cankers that can be primary inoculant sources in the spring for initiating walnut blight epidemics and by, be colonization sites for fungi like Botryosphera. 94% people said yes, and that's absolutely true. Um, we're demonstrating that these diebacks have the XAJ and there's no Botryosphera in the early part of the season. It's, there are similar symptoms of uh, dieback later in the season, which can be caused by Botryosphera, but there's no fungal tissues associated with this in the early season. And it's too cold for Botryosphera to cause infection. So that's absolutely correct. The second question is the use of different modes of action of bactericides is a strategy that can delay or prevent further selection of copper resistance or selection of resistance to the new bactericides like consuming that are being registered. And 98% of the people said true. And that's, that's absolutely correct from our way of thinking about how to manage and delay the further selection for copper resistance and protecting consuming from being um, overused. And so hopefully if we can get four or five different modes of action that can be rotated and selected for, then we should be able to have a sustainable program for years to come. Do Dodine's one of the big um, hopes here and that we're gonna be doing large demonstrations uh, this coming year with uh, full label support in 2022 of Dodine if all goes well. Great, thank you so much, Jim. So very quick, we have a few questions. Uh, one regarding the mycozeb, uh, is it still going to be allowed in 2021? Uh, also, do we have any type of maybe epiphytic bacteria that we can use it to compete with Xanthomonas? And the last things, very quick, uh, maybe uh, the, uh, the, uh, the average cost of Kazugamicin per, per acre. Okay, so. Mancozeb can still be used. We asked for a reprieve uh, last last April. The EU said it was going to cancel. The USDA and the US Trade Association uh, interfered and said that's not fair. So we're looking at possibly the cancellation of Mancozeb in uh, after this season. So we're looking at uh, they're going to allow imports this coming year under the current MRL, and then after this year. We're talking 2022, the MRLs will be lowered to zero. And then if any detections found, they could potentially close the market. So we're going to be advising people next year if you're to uh, if you're going to Europe, which is 38% of the industry, then we shouldn't be using Mancozeb for that uh, for that reason. Uh, so I don't know. The industry's got some tough decisions if if we want to uh, segregate fruit lots, orchards uh, for non-European markets or not, but um, 
that's that's the timeline for Mancozeb. Uh, new bacteria sites, we're testing these uh, natural products. Uh, we're testing bacteria. Uh, we've tested serenade and, and uh, double nickel. Uh, these things have an effect. They're reducing it, but they're not, like you saw with some of those biologicals, we get about 50% control went from 40 to 20 or from 36 to 15, but we're not getting these really high levels of control, like at down to five, 3% or 5%, like with the copper Mancozeb or the consuming Mancozeb rotation programs. So uh, that's the challenge. I mean, we're, that's why we're trying to identify these uh, maybe combinations of things, natural products like this ET91 uh, um, that, like essential oils can be used with maybe bacteria too. And so we'll see, we'll see where that takes us. Um, we're real hopeful on the different modes of action like the food preservatives. And uh, the last question was, what well, now? <laughs> I got carried away. Because, but, uh, but we are running a little bit out of time. So yeah. you can type the questions and we will move to our uh, next uh, presentation. Okay, so, thank you very much. Uh, thank you so much, Jim. So our second presenter or our last presenter actually will be Jolandra Richal. Jolandra, he is a UC IPM advisor covering San Joaquin, Stanislaus and Merced County. So Jolandra, we look forward to hearing from you about the uh, latest updates on Naval Orange Worm, Codling Moth and Pacific Flood Headwater in Walnuts. Good morning. Um, I'm not sure. Do you hear me okay? You can see my slides. Yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I think this is uh, this is the last talk of uh, today's uh, presentation, or second day of the Walnut uh, days. Um, so uh, I do have three pests here. That well, before I jump into that, I'll introduce myself. Uh, Jalendra Rizal. I am IPM advisor uh, covering Northern San Joaquin Valley. And uh, today I'm going to talk about three pests briefly, but major focus of the, today's talk will be on naval orange room. Uh, some of the work that we've done in support of the Walnut Board uh, last couple of years with Chuck Burks and Houston Wilson. Uh, I'll talk a little more about that aspect. Carling Moth, I'll just briefly touch on some of the monitoring tools. Um, and then I'll talk about flat-headed board briefly also. And I'm also hoping that I'll get a little bit of um, feedback from uh, from the from the audience on flat-headed were at the at the end. So hopefully I'll be able to cover that. Okay, moving on to naval orangeum. Just the uh, introduction slide. I don't need to go into detail in, in in that because everyone is familiar with naval orangeum. It caused not only caused the ill loss but also has a uh, potential to cause the uh, the indirect damage by causing the aflatoxin contamination because the larva is basically essentially feeding on the nut meat that creates the environment which is favorable for uh, aflatoxin producing fungus. Um, jumping into the into pest management tactics, um, just a general way where how, how we manage the naval one in walnuts. Um, we know that monitoring tools available and then use those monitoring tools as a criteria to make a management decision. It's still, it's very important part of the IPM. And uh, we do have various tools that you, you can see in here uh, for naval on uh, monitoring in, the, in, in wallets. For example, the one, the newer tool um, is called a phenyl propionate lure, PPO trap or lure. This is commercially available and can be used both mating disruption and no mating disruption block. And this catch is both males and females. So this is a kind of newer uh, trap and lure for uh, navel uh, in in walnuts and also the other crops. We do have the ob bait or female traps. That's essentially the pistachio bait, put it into satay in a, in a small bag put it into the wing trap so that attracts the female, mated female towards the trap. And that's how we can see the activity of females going uh, in, the, in the orchard. Uh, it also, it, it comes in a commercial name called Peterson, um, Peterson trap. 
So that those are the kind of uh, the, the newer, relatively newer traps. Pheromone traps, of course, we use it to track the male moth activity in the in the orchard, and also in some cases the the egg traps are also still uh, used if um, you know uh, alone or in combination with the with the other female traps, for example, Peterson trap. Um, in terms of the management option, the winter sanitation, uh, I know that there is, uh, you know, discussion that why, whether the winter sanitation is really uh, an important factor in uh, to consider in walnuts or not, that's compared to, you know, pistachio and, and almonds, but I think this is still the very important factor, even though we may not see the uh, the mummies on the tree all the times. You still have the mummies on the ground. And as you know, the nature of the naval onjum, they, they lay eggs wherever they find the opportunity. So winter sentencing is still the foundation of naval onjum management. So we need to think about that. Timely harvest is another thing. It depends, on, of course, it depends on the variety. Um, you know, whether you will be able to harvest these, some of the variety when it's right on the time in terms of maturity or other cases, you might be able to use the ethaphone and bring the harvest date a little earlier or uniform. Um, and so that you avoid those, you know, the later generation or later flight coming in and laying eggs on those, on those, um, on those uh, nuts. Also, uh, other cultural practices or sort of like indirect factors are minimizing the other sources of infestation for that, for example, carling moth um, or um, the, the carling moth or blighted nuts or any kinds of nut damage in season, navel on them, we, you basically utilize those and, and can, can get infestation. So you have a lot of carling moth damage, you likely have navel on them, use those um, and, then, and then cause and build the population in, in other words. Um, if you already have the carling moth damage and then navel on them get into it, probably it may not be economically, you know, that because it's the same nut, right? But at the same time, it's more, um, more about the building population with using these uh, inferior uh, quality nuts or, you know, in other sources, the nuts that are developing, uh, that were in, infested by other uh, sources. Um, husk split spray, I put it here. It's, uh, I know that it's not pretty standard and common across the industry. It's, it really depends on the need. And then the timing of naval onjum activity later during the husk split time, uh, because that's the time where all the nuts, regardless of the variety, are susceptible. So there might be the chances that if you are getting more damage, you might be able to use this. Uh, of course, the mating disruption is the option because uh, it uh, it shows that it has efficacy in terms of reducing the damage in. In, in, in the other, other nut crops, we're still doing more work on the on the walnuts, um, but we expect it happens the same way because of the kind of, um, you know, kind of similar, uh, well, in principally, but, you know, there are other factors also in playing into role. So the mating disruption is, is obviously, this should be the part of the program for sustainable management and a long-term uh, approach of, uh, of naval and germ control. Um, in the meantime, I also understand the cost and other things. So again, it should be considered as a part of the integrated program for long-term management of naval and germ, not just the one-year reduction in, in damage and uh, controlling naval and germ. Um, I listed some of the insecticide here for the, you know, house split treatment there, if there is need husk split treatment, but it's based on the UCIPM guidelines. I put it here because, you know, everyone is familiar with these insecticide and, and active ingredients more, uh, more common in, in not industry, not crop industry. Um, uh, but it's primarily Altacor and Trapid where, you know, so reduce risk insecticide. And then also that we have some pyrethroids and other options. So of course, they have their own pros and cons. Uh, we want to use it not only for naval onjum, but also we have to use it carling moth. So we need to think about how we can rotate this chemistry and use it different, different, different time uh, for the effectiveness. Okay, so now I, I wanna move back to the little bit of the naval onjum biology and why we're doing the work that we were doing in the past couple of years. Um, 
some of the aspect of naval onjum, as we all know, it's an opportunistic pest. It's highly temperature derived or dependent, uh, highly prolific, and they can lay eggs and you know hundreds, and then um, have a successful generations. They have multi generations, um, as we know, three to four generations. Um, other factors are they're well adapted to the various different environmental condition. Um, there and um, and and of course they are a strong flyer too. So having these different host crop in within the vicinity, uh, within the area helps naval onjum build the population slowly in there. So if you put all these together, it's really a it's an important pest and it's difficult to predict and control naval onjum, right? So that's what we're talking about all the times the newer tools and tactics including these mating disruption and also in a research wise, we're also talking about having sterilized insect technique, a sterilized insect technique might be the option in the, in the future, but it's still in research stage. So I'll focus and talk a little bit more about these four, uh, these three um, factors in the, in the next couple of slides. Just a general idea about naval onjum population in, in our area in, in, in terms of where I work in Northern San Joaquin Valley. This is uh, the 2020 data based on the male and female capture in Fairmont and Peterson Trap. Um, as you see, there are three to, you know, the, the, to up, to, up to the fourth flight of naval onjum based on uh, what we have seen in 2020. This is in Stanislaus County. And the one thing that I want to point out is the later part of the season in October, mid-October, you can see that pretty significant population of naval onjum in 2020. So that that can um, brings up the point that you know whether this population can uh, affect the late season uh, walnut variety at that time, right? And it this may or may not happen every year though. Um, so th that's why I think it's important to have these uh, mating, oh, these monitoring tools um, available to use against this pest. This is a similar thing from uh, San Joaquin County. Uh, again, we're seeing a more or less similar situation. Later part of the season, we had pretty high abundance of naval onjum in last year. So um, I mentioned that temperature is an important factor for naval onjum population. So Topin Patak, he is uh, uh, the assistant specialist at uh, UC Merced. He's a more, you know, climate change related uh, scientist. So he works on that aspect. And so we collaborated and looked at what happens with the you know, climate change that we're seeing, what happens if naval onjum population is exposed to these different extreme conditions that we expect to hope, uh, happen in the in, in the future and um, and looking at its impact to naval onjum population. Of course, this is a model based and there are a lot of different factors playing into role that may not be exactly translated into the what result we got may not exactly translate into the into into the naval onjum population in the future, but it provides us the sort of like a, so the idea. So we looked at 23 Central Valley counties, basically looking at the temperature data from those, and then also the future expected temperature from those, and uh, basically combine that with the naval onjum uh, biology essentially, and look at uh, what we can see in terms of changes in the future. So this is a summary of one figure. So I wanna have your attention on the very bottom um, figures here. Uh, you can see the 2005, 2040, 2070, and 2100. Um, so that's basically essentially the word we're trying to predict the, uh, the occurrence of the fifth flight in the Central Valley on that bottom uh, figure. So the middle one is fourth flight and then the top one is the third flight. So just focus on the fifth flight. Uh, based on that study in the historical so far, we consider that until 2005, there is no fifth flight of naval onjum throughout the valley. But 2040, you can see uh, in three county we have likely have the fifth flight occurring and 20 by the end of the century there is almost all the you know the central valley counties well 17 out of those 23 counties will likely have this fifth generation of naval onjum um, presence 
Um, not only that, but you also see that, you know, with the warmer winter, the nebulonium activity likely begin earlier. And with, uh, with the fall, with the increased temperature, you will have the extended period of activity later in the season too. So if you put those together and then the fourth flight already flying, there is a good chance that there is another fifth flight at the end of the season. Um, and, um, but again, this, this, you know, higher temperature doesn't mean all the time you increase the insect activity, uh, but insects are adapted to the, you know, higher temperature condition and then slowly they also adapted to these newer changes environment and kind of uh, build their population too. Uh, there are, could be the other factors that playing into role. So they, in a sense that, you know, in the future, we'll likely see the more uh, naval engine activity uh, uh, because of the climate change and also the other various reason that we know. The other reason is the host crop, right? So we have uh, these all different host crop that we know that three major nut crops with the stagger crop phenology, uh, they are contiguous pretty much throughout the Central Valley that provides the good environment for naval onjum to build and um, increase their abundance and population. Um, also, the walnut acreage, if you looked at the walnut acreage, has been increased by 80% or so in the last 20 years or so, as you see in here. And it's not only walnut, but it's the same thing with the pistachio and, um, and walnut uh, and almonds. And it's on the kind of, you know, about the same scale, even more in some cases. So that all together, if you combine those, uh, that, uh, that naval onja population has increased um, because of those. So the important aspect that we wanted to look at was, so if we had these, a lot of host crop out there of naval onjum, how these uh, population of naval onjum is doing in terms of their local, local infestation within the orchard versus the, the population that is building one orchard and going into the, you know, another orchard or another crop nearby and that type of aspect. So this is the work that Chuck Burks uh, from USD has um, led and then we're working this in, on the third year basically on, the, on this framework. Um, and so the idea for this one is one, one aspect is that we're looking at the moth that we captured in, in walnut orchard that is predominantly in walnut growing areas. Also the we're catching the moth in the walnut orchard that is predominantly, you know, occupied the, the nearby area with the, with the almonds. So there are two different scenarios that we and we wanted to look at and collect the moth and looked at the fatty acid content of those moths so that we know where they grew up as a larva, whether they grew up as a larva as a, in almonds or walnuts. So this is essentially what you were seeing the different fatty acid profile differences in almond versus walnut. So if we see that, if we're able to tease that apart from the moth, then we know where these, these moths um, come from. That's a that's a essentially the idea behind this. So we're basically comparing the source uh, source of naval onjum in walnut orchard between walnut dominated and almond dominated orchards. We're also comparing this to various type of uh, traps itself in terms of population. Also try to correlate whether there is any relation of these traps with the damage. Um, so that's the that's a that's an idea idea behind it. So uh, we use these three different attractant, OB Bay Peterson trap, phenyl propionate, and then a pheromone trap in the orchard setting. Um, we had Sacramento Valley, San Joaquin Valley, and then the, the South San Joaquin Valley, basically north and south. So six sites in each, um, each of these three regions. So again, walnut dominated and almond dominated regions. So it's, you can see some of these uh, pictures here. So red color represents the walnut domination and dark color represents the almonds. Um, and uh, on these sites, I don't want to go into detail these numbers, but here, if you looked at on this site, in each site, uh, we have these trap setting. We have the pheromone trap in the middle. So you, our trap, all the trap station is in the middle of that block. So we put the pheromone trap in the middle and then surrounded by the six OB position or Peterson trap. 
and then also the little further 50 meter apart we will put the ppo because we don't want to have the interference of the pheromone trap to the ppo so ppo is a little far distant so we have this setting for all six sites in each region so total 18 um, sites so here is the results um, of, of that. Uh, so basically looking at the pheromone trap here, um, what you are looking at is 2019 and 2020. Uh, just focus on 2020, I guess, uh, for just for the sake of the time. So here, the dotted line, what you are seeing is the number that were collected of the moth in pheromone trap from um, walnut dominated landscape. Right, so the three sites with walnut dominated, three sites in almond dominated in each region. So that's the kind of combination of that. So if you looked at that in the both pictures, you, the dotted line versus the other ones, there is no much, not much difference. So basically, we're catching the kind of more or less similar number of the moth in pheromone trap uh, in that regard. So there is no uh, uh, effect of the landscape. If you looked at um, this picture here, um, let's see oh, that, that will go away. This um, menu button is just kind of off. Um, so this one is we're looking at the um, the female traps here. So the female trap, if you looked at landscape effect, apparently you have uh, effect on both years. Um, so that means again we're looking at this dotted line, which is walnut dominated. Uh, landscape and then the solid line is the uh, is the almond dominated. So you can see almond dominated landscape has a lot more moth compared to walnuts. Um, the same thing here also later in the season, but in the earlier part of the season in 2020, by some re some reason we're seeing the more activity in the walnut dominated uh, area, more female activity in walnut dominated area compared to the almond dominated area. So um, I know it can be can be confusing, but we're seeing that uh, there is differences in terms of uh, landscape factor contributing to naval one zone population, especially on the female based on this, this picture. In PPO trap, um, landscape all effect also has well has also has the effect on the, the, the capture in PPO trap, which capture both males and females. Um, in this case, so um, again, we're going into, let's, let's focus on 2020. The dotted line is the one that moth captured in PPO traps in walnut dominated um, landscape. So if you looked at in September and October, we're catching a lot more moth in almond dominated walnut orchard compared to walnut dominated walnut orchard. Uh, so that, you know, that's nothing sort of like, I mean, you can sort of generalize that, right? So when there, once there are almond harvested nearby, you might have the influence of total population in the wal walnut orchard. And that's what exactly we wanted to look at. What's the sort of landscape level relation of these different population moving into uh, different crops. So in this case, we can say that, you know, the almond is, is contributing, if you have almonds, all surrounding your uh, walnut orchard, of course, you expect that naval onion will contribute some to your um, orchard also. Okay, so if you looked at the fatty acid content, so this is that, that one, the, what I described was all the trap capture. So this is the one that we looked at the fatty acid content and then see where these moth grew up as a larva. So here you can see fatty acid profile indicate that more immigrants in pheromone and OB bed trap in almond dominated landscape. So in other words, you can see um, that the immigrant, the white color uh, portion is the immigrant. That means that these moth that we captured in walnuts, but these actually grew up in somewhere else outside of the walnut orchard um, of that particular, well, outside of the, the walnut orchard in almonds because we're comparing almonds and walnuts. Um, and local means that we captured those these moths in walnut orchard. They were basically grew up from walnuts or potentially from the same same population, same same orchard. 
So if you looked at this, yeah, there is differences in there. Um, we don't see, uh, the, you can see the kind of similar difference here also in PP allure, uh, but not so much on walnut dominated area in here. So again, in a sense, we're seeing that these females and male moth that we're capturing in the walnuts is essentially uh, grew up somewhere else in, in almonds also. Um, that's, that's kind of tentative conclusion yet. We still have the one more year to go. We also looked at uh, the, these different kinds of trap and then the damage, uh, percentage damage or har at harvest, the relation. And, and pretty much we did not see much uh, strong relation. As you see the row, the number here, a row is basically the indicator of the correlation, right? So 0.14 is, is pretty low. This is negative 0.12, uh, this is 0.3. So the, you know, in a perfect situation, um, the, the, that value needs to be exactly one, right? So if there is a strong linear relation, that value would be, uh, well, I guess this is a non-linear type of assessment, but anyway, so in that case, uh, the trap capture versus the damage at harvest, um, it's not strongly related with these traps and wasn't, wasn't that surprising. Um, plus, I also want to mention that these are the 18 orchard that we surveyed and do the work. I think in order to identify these kind of correlation, we need to have a lot more orchard, a lot more data uh, to make a valid conclusion whether this really holds um, true. I think that would be uh, something that we will focus on in the future. Um, but so far we have not seen any strong relation of the trap capture with the damage in wallets. Interesting thing is that when we looked at the damage harv uh, the percentage damage of harvest between 2020 and 2019, we see stronger correlation there. As you see here, the raw value is 0.73. That's you know that's a pretty strong correlation. So in other words, uh, what it means to me, practical manner, is that if you have the damage last year likely have damage this year also by an Avalonjo. So that brings up the point that, you know, if we do the harvest sample, if you control or manage the Avalonjo now, you won't have, you know, much issue next year, or at least that will have some impact in next year. Um, and also that also strengthen the value of taking the harvest sample and looking at the damage and then see how, how much damage you are getting versus, you know, um, the, the expectation in next uh, next year. So that's a pretty good uh, sort of like a kind of um, um, outside of our purview in general in, in, in the beginning, but it turns out that there is a strong relation in throughout this uh, orchard. So yeah, I think it's, um, you know, in, in general, so we're seeing the impact of the post uh, landscape into the into the population of naval onjum. Uh, previous year damage was more strongly correlated with the current season damage in the same orchard. Again, this is the this is um, the 2021 would be our third year of the continue doing the same um, same trial. So that by the end of that, we'll have uh, sort of like a final uh, report. And so, but we're going into the, this direction based on what we have seen so far. Okay, so while I put the carling moth is also part of my talk, so I put a few slides in here. I'm not going to talk too much about it. We all know um, how to manage carling moth, I guess, uh, or I, well, I, I should say that I don't have too much research related data on carling moth. So I'll just go with just some, some general things in here. So this is a trap um, activity in, in uh, carling moth in um, 2020. The dotted line here is the number of the trap, well, number of the male moth capture in um, pheromone trap, carling moth trap, and the solid line is basically the showing the degree days um, in here. So you are seeing the you know up to three flight, which is pretty consistent. Uh, throughout the year. One thing that I want to point out that every year the carling moth activity fluctuate a lot as you see in, in the upper right, upper left, uh, the carling moth activity this year, the 
in my traps and there was very, very low activity up to two moths uh, per trap per day or per night versus, you know, 2017, if you compare that a lot more activity in the beginning of the season. So th that fluctuation happens all the times. And so every year is different. We should not target that, you know, 1A or 1B or 2A or 2EB just based on the calendar, but should be based on the than the, the, the number because they, they fluctuate a lot in different years. So we do have the trap, um, carling moth pheromone lure for monitoring the male moth activity as well as uh, the other um, um, the other active other CMDA lure also can be used in uh, basically for the mating disrupted block. We want to use the CMDA carling moth plus the caramon combined combo lure versus in the non-mating disrupted block. Um, we can use the pheromone lure for tracking the flight. So that's the, that's the thing that we need to consider and then use the biofix, uh, biofix um, based on the trap capture, track the flight and use the degree day for timing you know, carbon moth activity. Also the knot sampling and harvest sampling are a critical part of uh, the, the carbon moth uh, monitoring uh, as well. So next, I would like to talk a little bit more about the platyta bar, and then also um, also wanna give a uh, um, little bit of well uh, opportunity for uh, for the for the audience here to see whether you know the platyta bar is something that is occurring throughout the state. This will help uh, help me and then the, us to figure out what can be done in terms of research on flat headed bore issues um, in, in walnuts. So the flat headed bore name itself, it says, although it's not head, but the thorax part, it's, it's, it's flat. You see, this is a larval stage. Um, and this is an adult beetle, bupresti beetle. And it has these kind of subtle marks, three sort of lighter marks on the elytra. Uh, that's uh, more or less kind of identifying character um, of the bucrestid beetle, and this is the larva. So basically, the larva lay eggs. These uh, the, the adult lay eggs on the branches. Larva basically come out from the eggs. They go inside the bark, feed on the cambium layer, go deeper into the wood uh, by the you know by the fall or so, over winter there and then come out as a as an adult next year. So it has only one generation per year. So here are the, some of the symptoms I wanna show, but just pay close attention here because I wanna ask some, some questions later. Um, so what we have seen, I've seen the last couple of years of flat airborne infestation in different places. These are the, some of the collection of the pictures. Sometimes you see this trunk that has uh, this brown colored sap oozing is a indicator of the flat-headed borer. Um, if you looked at the peel out the bark, then you can see actual larva inside. Other times you see these uh, sunburn related, uh, the, the, the well damaged branches and then also the infestation there heavily as you see in this one. You can see when we looked at this and break this, uh, you can see the larva and then frass inside that um, inside that branches. Other times you can see the on the right hand side, you can see the flag branches on the tree. And if you don't look at closely, you don't even know whether that's that a flat or not. Other when you looked at closely, you can see this packed uh, feeding channel packed with the insect frass and also the larva in, in many cases. So these are the, some of the example uh, of these infestation in, in walnuts. Other times you can see the dead wood with the, these deceived holes as you see in here. And so that's also the indicator that the, moth, the, the beetle is coming out from that wood, basically the larva infested already on that, um, on that branches and pre pretty much killed it. So these kind of the symptoms that we, we saw and so far, um, and uh, I know many times these, these symptoms can be ignored because also the blamed with the something that may be canker or some other reason that, uh, that this happens. If, unless we look closely and then see the, the indication of the insect feeding, we may not be able to notice even uh, what's going on into the orchard. So that's my, um, my mass is in there. So in the last couple of years, when we looked at different trap types and other things, then uh, we figured it out that 
uh, there are two species around, um, Chrysobothrus, kind of more or less similar species around, but one of them is the one that causing damage, actual damage to the, to the walnut. So this is based on the trap capture. We see the two species, but when we rear out these uh, beetles from these infested wood, we found only one species called the Chrysobothrus mali. That's a Pacific flat-headed borer from all of our infested wood. So that's the one that causing damage um, on the wood. And we're seeing this highest level of emergency in around the mid-June of these adult from those, um, from those studies. So we don't have much uh, aspect in terms of insecticide use and other things. So we're going into that direction, but I think it's essentially, we try to uh, uh, maintain the good tree health, uh, remove these infested branches in the winter time. And if you need to use the, the, the white latex paint with the, mixed with the water as a painting agent for the younger trees to prevent the sunburn, those are the, some of the aspects that we could do to prevent the damage. So, so the next part is, um, it's a survey, it's a very short, there are like a 10 questions, but some of the questions it doesn't take even, you know, five, to 10 seconds. Um, so this one is more about identifying the flat-headed borer overall infestation throughout the throughout the throughout the state. If we have we if we have concern about flat-headed borer, have you seen any kind of these symptoms that I showed before? Those kind of questions. So that will help me to uh, formulate the research for the you know coming years. Um, I do have the funding from USDA for next three or four years. We're looking at a lot of aspect of finding the traps, finding the suitable lure, using uh, timing for insecticide control, well, efficacy of insecticide, all aspect of flat-headed world because literally there was no work done um, in the past. So we were kind of in the newer area looking at these different aspects and without knowing that what's going on in the state, I, don't be, I, I won't be able to uh, do uh, those things. So this survey, I would say, um, I'm almost running out of time, but I am still hoping that you'll be able to do that um, right now or, uh, and I, I think that there is a break coming up. So during that time, you can complete this. Again, there are 11 questions. So if you looked at on this one, you can take a, QR code uh, with your phone, you can take a picture and then it, it drag you to the to that survey link. It's um, also you can do this uh, link here. Um, let me see whether I'll be able to put that link um, in the chat also. But also if you can type in. Um, I think Gary, she already put it in the chat, right? Oh, so, okay. Yes. Thanks, Dr. Linder. Yes. Thank you so much. Yeah. And so also the, this lure, this, this link is a pretty, uh, well, I try to make it shorter. Um, so if you go tinyurl.com slash flatheaded, if you type on that, if some reason, if your link doesn't work, if you type on that, your, um, you know, web browser, you should be able to get that. If it's not, please let me know again. Just a very quick survey, if you can do that, that will help me and then us a lot in order to understand what's going on and what can be done in the, in the, in the future. So since you are doing um, this survey, I'll also, in the meantime, I'll, um, I'll thank the Walnut um, uh, Research Board, Walnut Board for funding these, these works, um, not only Naval Onjum, but also the Flathead Board in the past. Um, and a lot of other effort and uh, support from the Walnut Research Board. Um, plus, I would like to thank all the PCA growers, uh, whoever, and our technicians helping me in the various projects in, in, um, in, in this area. So um, um, I think uh, I'm still thinking that you'll be able to do it in, you know, within a few minutes or so. Um, I don't know, uh, yeah. maybe you can answer some of the questions yeah. at this point. Yes, thank you so much, Jalandra. I think uh, good timing, uh, very good presentation. So uh, Kelly, she launched now the poll. So we will have the poll questions. Then we will check some few questions. And there are four questions on this poll. So I'll give you a couple minutes. Make okay. sure you scroll through and answer all four questions. Um, 
Yeah. So take your time. We'll give you a little bit of time here to do that, that survey that was posted and these poll questions. Okay. Well, um, yeah, the first question was 94% got right. Yeah, that's all of the above, right? So we want to do the, all the traps and not sampling, just the criteria to evaluate overall carbon moth infestation. The second question, best practice for naval engine management. Um, yeah, all of the above. That's right. Which insect activity can be monitored using PPO trap? 80% got it right, that's great. Um, yeah, never launch them. Um, and what is, when is the best timing for insecticide spray if needed to control Hosca split spray? Okay, well, all good. Thank you so much, Jalandra. So we have a very few questions. So here we have, uh, are the naval orange worm flight graphs from 2020 derived from traps placed in almond or why not? Um, let, let me let me see the live chat portion maybe. Um, okay, so uh, the question was, um, can you can you repeat that again? Yes, uh, are the are the naval orange worm fly graphs from twenty twenty derived from traps placed in almond or in walnut? In twenty twenty, we're seeing more activity in the walnuts or almonds. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So you can you can type the answer if you want for this one. And for also, I don't know if we still have another time. Now it's 12 exactly. Uh, you can you can type the answer if you want. And uh, I think if, if people don't mind, take one or two questions live. Perfect. And then and then the rest, if you can answer by typing, we don't want to we want to be conscious of people's time. But maybe let's take two minutes to answer questions and then we'll Perfect. do the post stuff while he's typing the rest of the Perfect, question. thanks, thanks, Kelly. So another question from Brian, when should timely or short sanitation be completed? Um, yeah, okay, so the orchard sanitation completed by, while we're still, we still say that mid, mid March, we need to be completed everything. Um, uh, you know, in terms of the, you know, removing those, uh, the nuts or the nuts on the ground and all that. So uh, by mid, mid March. Perfect. Another question from uh, Rob. What have been sure. the correct trend of flathead bar in the first all shards they were found? Um, that's still there. Um, we're um, tracking some of these orchards that were found the flathead air borer. Um, and uh, especially the mature trees that we're seeing the branches are, you know, breaking and then, um, and, and, and uh, those, uh, you know, the, the ill loss basically because of the, the, her, the nuts are in there. Um, but yeah, the population is still there and more and more I'm seeing or people are contacting me about the, those and also the, some of the younger block that we have seen in the past three or four years. Some cases there was like pretty much 80 to 90% even more damage on the younger trees. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's still there. Okay, thank you, Jalandra. Another question from Ryan. When using uh, mating disruption to control navel orange worm, what approximate date should it start in the Sacramento Valley? When approximate date, when should we start mating disruption? In the Sacramento Valley. In the Sacramento Valley. I would say that, you know, in the Sacramento Valley, navel orange worm activity beginning time, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't vary that much. I mean, maybe seven days or so. So I would say, if you can do by mid-March, would be great. But uh, by April one would be would be the best. Um, you know, before at the latest by April one. Okay. So do we have another time for a question, Kelly or Kerry? Let or me just just I will. Um, if if you don't mind typing the rest of the answers, I do want to get the last continuing education information up for those people that do have other commitments. So I'm gonna. Stop your sharing, and okay. I'm going to take over sharing the screen and go over the last information. Okay, thank you. Um, 
So thank you everyone for being here. Thanks again to the Walnut Board for sponsoring the event. We couldn't have done it without you. Um, a couple things. First of all, I just dropped in the chat a link to evaluate this today's day of the, the conference. Um, this uh, evaluation is really, really important. Tells us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong. We don't care. Any feedback is great. We want to know so we can better prepare for future events. For DPR, this is if you're a private applicator, a PCA, um, you are going to get an exam emailed to you by tomorrow morning at the latest. You do not need to email me unless it's tomorrow morning and you have not received this exam. It takes me a while to process who actually attended and send the email out. So don't worry, you're getting it. It will be in your inbox by tomorrow morning. You have one week to take this exam and you must pass with 70%. I recommend taking it within the first 24 hours of receiving it. For one, it's fresh in your mind. And two, if you don't pass, I'll give you another version of the test, but you still only have that one week to take it. So the longer you wait, if you don't pass, the less time you have to take the exam. Um, you'll get your results, I say, within one week. Generally speaking, it takes about three days in the beginning, and then you, you, you hear pretty much rapidly after that. Um, I get a slew of, of notifications and I have to work through them one at a time. Um, if you need any assistance or any problems, you can email us. Um, uh, yes, Bob Beattie just mentions a lot of you had your confirmation email sent to your junk. So when you log in tomorrow morning, check your junk folder. The junk folder might have that email with the link to take the exam. Um, certified crop advisors, the QR code is on the screen, you can try scanning it with the app. Again, this is not related to DPR. This is Certified Crop Advisor. Um, so go ahead and, and open the app. I'll leave it open for the next few minutes. Um, and I don't, Carrie, was there anything else you wanted to add? I just want to say thanks to everybody, everyone involved and everyone participating and everything and yada, yada. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. I think with that, we could probably uh, wrap it up. Well, um, are you going to close it or we'll have some time to answer this question or we'll yeah. do that? Uh, if you guys want, I'll leave this up for another couple minutes and you can go ahead and answer those questions live if you want. Um, and then if I have to leave, Carrie is, is, will be able to keep the meeting running, but I'll leave this up there and you guys can go ahead and go through the questions. Okay. Maybe, maybe a few minutes. I'll just type in some of the answer and then go. Please do. Please do, Jalindra. I'll hang around if need be. Thank Thanks, you, and thank you, Mom, Muhammad, for doing such a great job moderating today. Thank you, Katie.